All right, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the Cancer Emerging Hallmarks and enable, car Enabling Characteristics session. Um, my name is Niall Howlett. I am a professor of cell and molecular biology here at the University of Rhode Island. I have been affiliated with the Rhode Island INRI program throughout my entire tenure at the University of Rhode Island, uh, many, many different capacities. Um, my research program focuses on DNA repair and the maintenance of genome stability. Um, we study this through the lens of a rare disease called Fanconi anemia. Um, my co-chair for this session is Dr. Shireen Elsawa from the University of New Hampshire, um, who I'll turn it over to now for a brief introduction. Good morning and welcome everybody. Um, like Miles said, I'm Shireen El Sawa and I'm an associate professor of immunology at the University of New Hampshire. Um, my research interests are um, focused mainly on the role of the tumor microenvironment in cancer. And we study this using a rare uh, B cell lymphoma called Waltenstrom's macroglobulinemia. Thank you, Shireen. Um, so we have a total of seven talks today um, that actually span a wide range of cancer topics um, and cancer types. Um, just some housekeeping, I'd remind you to um, enter your questions into the chat box and, and I will get to them um, after the conclusion of the talk. Um, I'd encourage all of the speakers to uh, pay attention to the time um, and I really look forward to a, a, a great, exciting session. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Shireen to introduce our first and mini keynote speaker. Thank you. So our first um, talk is our mini keynote talk, which is going to be presented by Mary Jo Turk, um, who's a professor at Dartmouth Medical School. She's also associated with the Norris Cotton Cancer Center, and she will talk to us about resident memory T cell responses to cancer. Uh, Mary Jo. Thank you, Shireen. Niall, thank you so much for this invitation to be with you this morning. Let me get my slides up here. All right, can you guys see this in projection view okay? Yes, all good. All right, wonderful. So, and I think we're three minutes early, so hopefully we'll get off to a great start this morning. Um, so it's really a pleasure to be here and talk to you about my work in, in memory T cell responses to cancer. Memory, um, we say memory, um, called memory T cells memory because they remember the antigen that they encountered. And we think this is so important for immunity to cancer to have durable uh, T cell responses. And so I'm gonna talk to you today about um, some background only 20 minutes, but some background into the work we've done leading up to this. And then um, the data I'll give you is, is from a study that's um, unpublished, but just accepted yesterday for publication. So hot off the presses. So, um, okay. So really T cell responses to cancer are so critical, we think because of two features of T cell immunity. And we study CD8 or cytotoxic T cells, but the first feature being a longevity. So T cells after their initial priming, this is just in terms of days, um, you get priming of a strong effector response, but then most of these cells die. Um, it's the memory T cells that persist for months to years afterwards. And um, adaptive immunity is able to do this. And then when re-encounter with pathogen and, or in our case, tumor happens later, these cells are poised to respond more robustly. Uh, the other feature of memory is it's, uh, I'm sorry, of T cells um, that is so important is specificity that they have a receptor that can specifically recognize tumor antigens. So really two critical features of T cells that make them so valuable for their uh, response to cancer. And you can see here memory, these long lived T cells, they're shown in this nice figure as multiple colors and they're truly heterogeneous and there are many different ways to break down memory. But um, we, uh, separate these populations into two major groups um, based on where they're found. And so T cells that persist were earliest studied um, in circulation, those that you can sample from blood. And uh, there are many subsets of T cells, central effector memory, stem-like memory that do recirculate. 
Um, but more recently, in the last 10, 15 years, it's been shown that populations of memory T cells don't recirculate. They're populations that actually durably reside in tissue, and those we call resident memory, um, or TRM. So I've abbreviated this TCIRCM and TRM. And TRM cells um, is shown here in a skin image. I'll talk a little bit about skin, um, but they stay durably resident in tissue. And so um, that's interesting to us, and we can find them based on their markers. I'll talk to you a little bit about their phenotypes. We can see that they look very different. In addition to being stably resident in tissue, they also express markers that are adhesion molecules that keep them in tissue, which is in contrast to circulating memory cells, which express markers that bring them out of tissues. And so um, we've done work over the past several years to show that resident memory T cells are important for immunity to cancer. And this is because they are found and they're already present in tissues where tumors grow and metastasize. Um, skin, lungs, brain, um, reproductive tract. And we study melanoma, so we're most focused on skin, but certainly cancers metastasize to all these organs. So this has really led us to study in my lab the basic question of which of these memory T cell responses, circulating or resident or both, how do they contribute to immunity to cancer? And in the studies I'll be talking to you about today, um, it's important to focus on a model in which you do get durable immune responses to cancer. And a great deal of our work has been done, I'm not gonna show um, much human data today, but um, we do work in patients uh, with patient specimens as well. And we work with this phenomenon in melanoma patients called autoimmune vitiligo. So melanoma is a disease of um, cancer of the melanocytes, which are the pigment producing skin cells. And when some patients treated specifically with checkpoint blockade immunotherapies develop really strong immune responses against their melanoma tumors, there's sometimes seen about 20% of the time cross-reactivity, those T cells don't distinguish between the melanoma and the melanocytes, the pigment producing skin cells um, that gave rise to the tumor. And so you see a condition called autoimmune vitiligo, and this is CD8 T cells coming into the skin and killing melanocytes. And what's really um, fascinating and what one might expect is that patients that have these really robust autoimmune responses in their skin, you can see these are data published a few years ago by another group. These are the patients that had vitiligo and you can see their survival with melanoma is much better than the patients who got the same immunotherapy but did not get vitiligo. So this model has intrigued us for a number of years and um, we actually quite serendipitously modeled this in mice um, about 15 years ago when I started my lab. We, we used B16 melanoma, commonly used melanoma model. Um, the therapy that we use is actually depletion of regulatory T cells. And we do that by total CD4 T cell depletion. That's not therapeutic on its own. So we also have to do a surgery to excise the tumor. But with this simple treatment scheme, just simply having regulatory T cells absent for a period of 12 days followed by surgery, uh, about 70% of our mice after that develop this vitiligo, like what's seen in patients in mice, it, it's grow outgrowth of white fur. Um, I've abbreviated this in some slides as MAV or which stands for melanoma associated vitiligo. But these mice, their, their CD8 T cells have actually broken tolerance to the antigens on normal melanocytes. And that's why we see this. And um, if we stratify mice based on those, that, like I showed in patients, those that got vitiligo versus those that didn't, we still don't know why some do and some don't, um, something we've been looking at for a long time. But if we take those mice and then at a late memory time point, 60 days after their primary tumor was removed, if we re-challenge those with vitiligo, versus those that were unaffected, you can see that those with vitiligo are better protected um, against melanoma rechallenge. This is uh, important to point out, this is a rechallenge in the dermis. So the first tumor is given in the skin, the dermis, and then the rechallenge is done in the dermis as well, and they're protected. And we studied dermal tumor protection for several years and um, published a few years ago that actually, and what you're looking at here are hair follicles, 
and uh, the dermal epidermal junction of mice with vitiligo. And in yellow, our tumor antigen, GP100 is the antigen, tumor antigen specific T cells. These are specific for melanoma and they go into the hair follicle and the skin and they persist as resident memory. And we showed that these cells are required for protection against rechallenge in the skin. And in fact, you didn't need to bring cells in from circulation. It was simply the resident memory cells that were already present in the skin that protected those mice. So this was interesting and new to us, but um, I'm gonna talk today about metastasis because what we also find is that if we rechallenge these mice with vitiligo in the tail vein to generate these metastatic like tumors in the lungs, in fact, they're protected from that as well. And um, if we rechallenge in the portal vein to give disease in the liver, they're protected in the liver. So it's not just about skin, but it is um, consistent with patients who have uh, protection throughout their bodies against metastatic melanoma. So in the next half, I'm gonna talk to you about um, what, what memory T cells mediate um, immunity at metastatic locations. So we know, and I have in green here, resonant memory T cells we know are important in the skin, but at metastatic locations, is it the circulating memory cells or resident memory or both that are important? And I'll show you some flow cytometry data. We're looking in the box are um, what we call PML cells. These are transgenic T cells that we use to monitor the response. They're not needed for the immune response, but we transfer in the small population of melanoma specific T cells and we can track them with this marker thi 1.1. And this is the tumor draining lymph node. This is 30 days out after therapy and surgery. So this is definitely a memory response, but you can see we find them in the tumor draining lymph node and the spleen, they stick around. Skin is where we know we have a lot of these cells. We know they're resident memory, but we also find them in these other organs lung and liver where we have protection. So we wanted to better understand this response. And so we phenotype these cells by flow cytometry and looking at some markers, um, I'll just, I don't wanna go into detail, but these are the different tissues and in skin, resident memory cells have very high levels of CD103 and CD69. Um, so we were expecting to find these markers in skin, but not in other tissues. But if you look here, you can see well, they're actually expressed to varying levels with the exception of spleen really throughout. So by flow cytometry, it was quite difficult to determine what types of memory cells were in these organs. So we've used some other techniques to get at it. I'm gonna tell you about two now. The first is um, a, a biological technique and um, it's called parabiosis. So this first appeared in the literature over a century ago, um, the idea of of conjoining circulation in mice um, to equilibrate populations between the mice. So we took our mice with melanoma associated vitiligo that had, I'm shown here in green, these tumor specific T cells. And we actually surgically conjoined them for 14 days to join circulation. It's a fairly complex surgery, but it works quite well. Um, and they're joined for 14 days and they're relatively, um, um, healthy during that period, and they join circulation, and then we separate them. And this is really the only, the only um, experiment that can be done to definitively assess whether memory is resident, because you can imagine that anything that's circulating will equilibrate and appear in the recipient mouse, but anything that's resident will just be in the donor mouse. And um, here's the data and you can see the tumor specific T cells as expected in spleen, we get full equilibration telling us that all these cells are, res are sorry, are circulating. Um, by contrast in skin, nothing moves over to the recipient mouse. These are clearly resident. So what we saw in lung was kind of a mixture where we have some equilibration, but it wasn't, it wasn't as strong as spleen. So we had a mixture of resident and circulating memory in lung. And but what really surprised us was when we looked in lymph node, where we expected everything to be circulating. And in fact, what we saw was that lymph node also contained overwhelmingly cells that were resident there that didn't leave that lymph node. And I'll just show you um, in white are these cells. They're present throughout the lymph node. This is a, a lymph node from a mouse with melanoma associated vitiligo. And we've done some work to look more carefully at what differentiates these cells. 
So um, we've taken mice with vitiligo and we've sorted tumor antigen specific cells from skin, lung, lymph node, liver, and perform single cell RNA sequencing to get really a, a wide view of these cells. And what I'll show you here is um, the UMAP. So looking at these cells, cells that are more closely clustered together are transcriptionally more similar. Those that are broken apart are more distinct. But I've colored this by tissue of origin. So this was a clonal population of tumor-specific T cells that went to different organs. And you can see that really their transcriptional profile is dictated by the tissue to which they arrived and where they resided as memory. And I'm just gonna break it down. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time because I don't have a lot of time, but looking in lung, these are just the cells from lung. Even within lung, we can break out heterogeneity of this clonal population of T cells where we have these two populations and based on their gene expression, we know that they're more circulating like and these are the dominant populations in lung. But in lung, we actually have this small population of cells that has a very resident transcriptional profile. Whereas in lymph node, it was the opposite. This tiny population here had more circulating like transcriptional profile where a majority of these cells, as we saw with the parabiosis data, as we would expect, were more resonant like in their gene expression. And I'll just point out one of these populations has a signature of responding to type one interferons, which was very curious to us. And we're, we don't know where they're getting those signals and we're looking at that now. Um, but just to st summarize for a minute, let me check my time here. Um, in lung, we know that we have a dominant population of circulating memory in these mice and a smaller population of resident memory. Whereas in lymph node, it's the opposite but quite unexpected that most of the tumor specific T cells don't leave this lymph node. And um, we weren't really thinking of the lymph node as a metastatic site until we saw these data. But in fact, lymph nodes are the primary, the, the earliest site of metastasis for most solid cancers. So we kind of changed our thinking to ask, well, what about lymph node? Might lymph node also be protected against tumor? And B16 melanoma, those of you who know it, know it doesn't spontaneously metastasize to lymph node. Um, so what we did was we artificially made it go there by just directly doing an injection into the lymph node. And that works quite well. This is in naive B6 mice. You can see seeding of the B16 cells imaged here in luciferase in the lymph node that they were in injected in. Um, but vitiligo affected mice actually, as one might expect, because they have these robust T cell populations in lymph node are quite well protected. Um, and if we deplete, this is untreated, this is individual mice, they're well protected. If we deplete CD8 T cells, we lose that protection. So we know it's CD8 T cell mediated. So um, the, the last data I'm gonna show you is, now we know that these mice are protected in lymph node, and we know that the dominant population in lymph node is um, resident memory, but it's hard to conclude just with that, that resident memory is required because it's possible that when you re-challenge on the lymph node, or the lung, you know, cells come in from circulation. So to definitively ask which cells were mediating protection in these tissues, um, we conducted parabiosis studies and then re-challenged. So we took mice that had tumor protection and we parabiosed them to naive mice for 14 days. So that would pass along um, circulating memory, but the original donor mice would have resident and circulating. So we have these two compartments separated. And then we re-challenge either intravenous for lung metastases or directly into the lymph node and we track tumor growth. So I'll first show you the IV re-challenge and then I'll show you the intranodal. So here's naive, just mice control. You can see they got lung, B16 lung metastases and the mice with vitiligo um, are well protected. Now, these are the mice that had been parabiosed for 14 days. So they acquired the circulating memory from these mice, but not the resident memory. And as we look at across experiments, they're actually really well protected. So we could conclude that actually circulating memory T cells are sufficient for tumor protection in the lungs. Now in the lymph node, we can see tumor growth in the naive controls. Here we have the mice with vitiligo. One didn't get it. Uh, um, the tumor, but regardless, if we look at mice that were parabiosed, they are not um, at all protected. So the story is quite different in the lymph node. And as we hypothesized, 
resident memory T cells are actually required for tumor protection in the lymph nodes. So this really kind of opened our eyes to this new population of T cells that is maintained in lymph nodes. Um, and I'll just show you one more piece of data going back to human before I conclude. Um, we actually took the gene signatures. We have some data I can't show you that we're starting to find these similar cells in lymph nodes of melanoma patients. And we took our mouse gene signatures um, in collaboration with Chow Chang, a computational biologist at Baylor. And we generated signatures that um, were specific to skin resident memory, lung circulating memory, or lymph node resident memory. And then we looked in the, can the Cancer Genome Atlas at patient um, tumor specimens and tried to find these enriched signatures to look if they were prognostically meaningful. And you can see looking at all melanoma um, data in TCGA, that skin TRM signature, this is with a high signature in red, is somewhat prognostic as is lymph node TRM, lung circulating memory less so. But what was really interesting was when we only looked at specimens that were lymph node metastases in TCGA. So these are lymph nodes containing metastatic melanoma. You can see there that the signature that performs by far the best is the lymph node resident memory signature. So this suggests to us that this population may also be um, important for immunity to um, cancer in patients as well. And we're following these data up now. But the take home message being that location is important. And um, whereas in lung, circulating memory is critical, um, in lymph node actually, in, and skin as well, resident memory is critical. So the type of memory that you need varies on the tissue location. And I just like to uh, acknowledge the lab who did the work, particularly two very talented graduate students, Alexei Maladsov and Nikhil Katwani, um, who uh, are co-first authors on the paper that's just been pressed now. And I'd like to thank my, my collaborators, Eno Hong at Dartmouth, Chow Chang at Baylor, Case K. Shirai, our, our um, melanoma oncologist, Christina Angelis, University of Michigan. Um, I started my lab on a COBRA grant and we've since gotten other uh, support for this work, but um, it's been a great collaborative effort and I'm happy to take any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you so much, May Jo. That was very good, very exciting talk. Um, so we have one question in the chat and it is from Sonali. Um, this is exciting presentation. Is there a dynamic exchange between the circulating and resident memory T cells, or are the pools unchanged once the cells are assigned to a specific location? Yeah, that's a great question. So in the steady state, we don't believe there is. We've done skin grafting studies to show that actually um, in skin, at least these populations don't recirculate out of skin. In lymph node, we've started to do some lymph node transplant studies and we don't believe that they recirculate. However, when during recall, when we reintroduce tumor, um, we don't know at that point. We don't know if these cells can rejoin circulation, move to other tissues. And that's actually a question we wanna answer very soon. Excellent. Another question from Shireen. Um, in the MAV mice, do you find resident memory cells in distant lymph nodes? Oh, thanks, Shireen. Great question. We do. So we looked across skin draining lymph nodes, and I think it's because the mice have just profound vitiligo in some cases. All skin draining lymph nodes do contain them. If we look like in the mesenteric lymph nodes, and we haven't gone much further than that, we don't see them. So we think it's really like a skin wide thing. Um, but we, we really need to follow that up more. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I have a, a question. Um, so these resident memory T cells, um, could you harvest them from patients prior to immunotherapy, maybe expand them in, in, in vitro and then do an autologous transplant? Is that something that's feasible? Yeah. Yeah. So now we, we, um, we are thinking a lot about this. It's not unfortunately um, going to be that straightforward, I don't think. It, from our mouse studies and from some of our work in patients as well, when we take these cells out of um, skin being the place where we can find the most of them, we haven't <coughs> um, done as much work with lymph nodes, but we're starting to. They're not, um, they're not really happy, I guess I could say, when they get out of their, their niche in tissue. 
And so unlike circulating cells that you can culture and you can expand and they're happy not being adherent, I have a sense that these cells are just, um, they, they have some signals that they get in tissue that makes it very difficult to culture and expand them or at least do that and maintain properties. Most often they die. And so what we're focused on now for, from a therapeutic perspective is more what's the circulating or what's the precursor state of these cells? Is there a precursor that we can find maybe at priming that's destined to become resonant memory? And then are we going to need tissue cues to direct them and get them into tissue? So it's actually going to be more complicated, but I think it's certainly worth um, pursuing this therapeutically. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, so I think we can move on. I want to say thank you very much for your talk. Um, very cool stuff. Um, uh, and we're ahead of time. So we're five minutes ahead of time, which is even better. So thank you so much, Mary Jo. Thank you. So our next talk is um, from Sonali Barway, who is a senior research scientist in the Cancer Modeling Laboratory at the Alfred um, DuPont Hospital for Children in Wilmington, Delaware. Um, Sonali will be telling us about immunotherapy options for pediatric AML, um, from target identification to clinical trials. Um, thanks, Sonali. Thank you for the introduction. Um, let me see the slide share. All right, so once again, I want to thank the organizers and the session chairs for giving me this opportunity to present our work on the development of uh, immunotherapy options for pedi pediatric acute myeloid leukemia. Um, and, and I'm going to describe the story from bench to bedside, if you will, from uh, target identification to um, it's, it's uh, application in clinic. Uh, so, so with our mini keynote speaker, Dr. Turk giving us a uh, uh, jumpstart on the immunotherapy, I just want to quickly uh, reiterate that immunotherapy is now widely recognized as one of the main hold uh, pillars for cancer therapy, in addition to the surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy options that have uh, existed for the past several decades. And this is mostly because of the work from Dr. Jim Allison and Dr. Honyu, who received their uh, Nobel Prize in Physiology Medicine in 2018. And they described the uh, immune checkpoint blockade mechanisms, which could uh, be used in cancer immunotherapy. Um, so wh why, why do we need to uh, work on developing immunotherapy options for pediatric AML? Uh, pediatric AML is the deadliest malignancy in children, and it is characterized by an accumulation of immature cells in the bone marrow. Um, which crowd out the uh, normal hematopoietic stem cells and lead to uh, several uh, debilitating symptoms. And the current treatment options just include cytotoxic chemotherapy and stem cell transplantation, which are very, very uh, strong. And yet the five-year survival rate is only 70%, meaning that upwards of 30% of children with AML tend to relapse, and this relapse is chemoresistant, and they have no other options in, with respect to therapy. Um, so, so therefore, uh, the idea of developing immunotherapy for these pediatric AML patients uh, comes to the forefront. Uh, but the challenges are that, uh, similar to other hematologic malignancies, uh, pediatric AML patients also have low mutational burden. So we have less uh, chances of um, 
finding new antigens or cancer specific antigens. And um, additionally, um, the genomic landscape of pediatric AML is, is greatly different uh, from the adult AML. So the adult AML specific targets um, cannot be easily applied to the pediatric scenario. Um, so therefore, um, we, we were on the hunt for uh, an ideal immunotherapy target for pediatric AML. And an ideal target would be one that is absent on normal cells and is expressed at really high levels on malignant cells. And ideally, it's expressed in all malignant cells, meaning a homogeneous expression at the cell surface. And if it can also be expressed on the cancer stem cells or the stem cells resident within the bone marrow that then lead to disease relapse would be an, a bonus. Uh, so here is uh, the, the different uh, potential AML antigen targets that have been you know, that, uh, investigated by other researchers. Um, and amongst these, the CD33 and CD123 are the ones that at the, are at the forefront. However, uh, the, the toxicities are really high because these antigens are shared by the normal hematopoietic stem cells. And, and therefore, um, this, the, this is, these are not the ideal uh, immunotherapy targets. Um, so the NCI, the National Cancer Institute, uh, led this initiative, which is called TARGET, meaning therapeutically applicable research to generate effective treatments for pediatric AML specifically. And here is a cool usage of an acronym target that uh, clearly defines what, uh, what is the goal of this initiative. So uh, via this initiative and extensive genomic analysis of uh, several patient samples, we were able to Uh, we were able to identify mesothelin, which was expressed in 35%. Uh, so one out of every uh, three pediatric AML patients. Um, and if you look at the adult AML population, uh, the expression level of, or I should say the expression of mesothelin is restricted to only 10 to 15% of adult AML patients. Um, so if we were looking at it from the adult perspective, um, we would have missed this target because it is uh, infrequently expressed in adult AML. Um, and here um, I'm showing you the comparisons between um, the expression of uh, mesothelin in AML versus those in solid tumors. Uh, so mesothelin is already a well-validated target and is expressed in several solid tumors. And the expression patterns uh, are not identical, but they overlap in some sense um, in the mesothelin positive solid tumors in relation to mesothelin positive pediatric AML samples. Um, so as I said, mesothelin is a well-validated target for solid tumors um, and it is, uh, a GPI anchored protein. So it's a peripheral membrane protein uh, that is anchored to the membrane by uh, GPI. Um, and uh, the, the best feature about mesothelin is that it is not expressed in the normal bone marrow cells. Um, and in, additionally, it is also dispensable for normal cell function. Um, so therefore it presents as uh, an ideal immunotherapy target um, for pediatric AML. Um, in, in addition, the mesothelin expression uh, in normal cells is restricted to the luminal surface, like the lining of the lung and uh, so on. And this luminal surface is, uh, is immune privileged. So in, in that sense, it, from all different uh, perspectives, mesothelin is an ideal candidate for uh, immunotherapy, specifically in the pediatric population. Um, so here I'm showing you, so the, the previous data was uh, uh, at the 
mRNA level, the transcript data. And here I'm showing you the flow cytometry plots uh, of the cell surface expression of mesothelium in different patients. So these are four different patients. And we see that uh, in, in the expression is homogeneous and a majority of the cells do express mesothelium. And this is in comparison with other markers. So here we have mesothelin expression, um, cells expressing mesothelin above the autofluorescence cutoff uh, in, with respect to other uh, known AML markers. So it is, uh, the expression is consistent. Um, so a, a quick run through of the different types of uh, targeted immunotherapy. Now that we have identified mesothelin as a pediatric AML specific target, we wanted to evaluate first preclinically uh, the different modalities of uh, targeted immunotherapy options. And um, one could be using antibodies or antibody drug conjugates. And the other modality is bispecific antibodies, which uh, on, on one hand, they link the T cells via the CD3 and on the other hand, they link the cancer cells, or in this case, the AML blasts uh, via the cancer-specific antigen, which is mesothelium. Um, and then the other options would be cell-based therapies, such as the chimeric antigen receptor expressing T cells or the TRUX, so the CAR Ts and the TRUX. Um, and then there are certain uh, natural killer cell-based therapies also available. So in order to evaluate these uh, types of uh, novel immunotherapy options for pediatric AML, uh, the model system we used is a, a disseminated model of patient-derived xenografts. Um, in this model, we use immune deficient mice and inject them with uh, uh, leukemic cells from the patients and uh, via the tail vein. And what happens is the cells home to the bone marrow and uh, recapitulate all the features of uh, leukemia in a patient. Um, so we see leukemic cells in the peripheral blood, which is how we monitor the disease progression. Uh, because unlike subcutaneous tumors, we are unable to, to measure the, the tumor growth. Um, but the flow cytometry of peripheral blood allows us to monitor disease progression. And at the end of the, uh, the, in the terminal stage, uh, we are able to harvest cells from the, uh, the enlarged spleens from these mice and able to propagate the, and re-inject in the recipient mice and able to uh, propagate the model this way. So using this model, we uh, did uh, first uh, established several uh, different types of pediatric AML xenograph models. And uh, shown here are these 10 or 12 different um, models. And then we tested the expression of mesothelium. And we saw that about one third of the, our models did express mesothelium, which was very similar to what was observed in uh, the uh, patient pop in a large patient population about 33% of the patients express mesothelin. Um, and this was done by a quantibright uh, quantitation of mesothelin expression. So upon confirmation of uh, mesothelin expression, uh, we utilized this antibody drug conjugate, which is uh, already used in the clinic for solid tumors. Um, and it, it was provided to us by Bayer. And it, the antibody, mesothelin targeting antibody, is conjugated to a microtubule inhibitor drug, DM4, and um, thereby it targets specifically the uh, malignant cells. And uh, the microtubule inhibitor is internalized in the cells and then mediates cell death that way. So in order to first test the specificity of this approach, we utilized K562, which is an AML cell line, uh, and which does not express endogenously mesothelin. So we overexpressed mesothelin and um, tested the uh, effect of this antibody drug conjugate. And we found that uh, whereas the isotype antibody had not, not much of an effect, 
the mesothelin specific antibody prolonged the survival in these mice. And uh, here is a snapshot of the spleens, which were very small compared to um, either the uh, chemo chemotherapy treated mice or the mice treated with the isotype antibody. Uh, whereas in the, the mice engrafted with the parental K562 cells, uh, this mesothelin specific antibody drug conjugate did not have any effect, thereby uh, showing us that this effect was highly uh, specific for mesothelin and targeted to mesothelin. Uh, we then used another model, which is MV411, a pediatric AML cell line, which also does not express mesothelin, but upon overexpression, we were able to show that the, uh, in this model, we actually saw a durable response and a complete remission in majority of the mice um, treated with this antibody drug conjugate. So we then moved on next to uh, determine the efficacy of this antibody drug conjugate in patient-derived xenograft models. So we picked one mesothelin positive PDX model and a mesothelin negative PDX model. And what we're showing here is um, the efficacy with, with two cycles of treatment versus three cycles of treatment, which was much better, uh, indicating a dose response effect in this uh, mesothelin positive PDX model. On the other hand, in the mesothelin negative, so it's really a negligible exp um, uh, expression, which is considered negative, um, we, we did not see any effect of the uh, antibody drug conjugate treatment, even, at, even with two cycles of treatment. So all these uh, data highlight to the specificity and efficacy of the mesothelin targeted antibody drug conjugate, which I am uh, very happy to share with you that it is now in, used in clinic um, for secondary relapsed pediatric AML patients. So next, we decided to test the effect of uh, uh, by specific antibody, like I was telling you. So this is a single chain variable fragment type approach where we have the, uh, the variable, uh, the light chains and the heavy chains combined in a single fragment. Um, those directing, uh, recognizing the mesothelin and those recognizing CD3 for pulling together the T cells. Um, so here is showing that in in, um, in vitro, using these um, bispecific antibodies, we saw not only that there was cytotoxicity, but also that these cells triggered uh, the, the um, release of cytokines such as IL-2, interferon gamma, and TNF-alpha, which is what is observed in uh, when the T cells are now uh, uh, activated by these bispecific antibodies. So in vitro, we were able to uh, activate the T cells, which functioned as the effector cells and uh, mediate uh, killing of the target cells. So uh, next we tested these uh, bispecific antibody molecules in, uh, in vivo using our MV411 uh, model expressing mesothelin and those without mesothelin. And here is um, the uh, schematic. So we injected human T cells from a different donor um, to serve as effector cells, because as I mentioned previously, these are immune deficient mice. So they do not have any um, uh, functional immune cells or so functional T cells are absent. And so we used human T cells as effector cells. And um, on day one, the T cells and the bispecific antibodies were injected together, followed by uh, five more doses of the bispecific antibodies. And what we see here is that um, in the cell, in the mice receiving um, mesothelin expressing MV411 cells, and with two different uh, bispecific antibodies, we saw that uh, a great reduction in the bone marrow load, whereas in the 
cells that do not express mesothelium, we did not see this effect. Um, so this shows that it is a, the bispecific antibody are specifically targeting the cells that express mesothelium. Um, and what I wanted to point out here was the, the persistence of T cells in the bone marrow after uh, the end of the experiment. So in, in the terminal stage, we did see that the T cells persisted throughout the experiment. And here I'm showing in immunohistochemistry, um, the CD3 staining uh, of, the, of the T cells. So next we evaluate. Hi, Sonali, I have to um, give you, you have a, about a one minute left. We're gonna have to um, end it very soon, please. Thank you. Sure, sure. I'm almost done. So we next evaluated this in uh, patient-derived xenograph model. And I'm just showing you that it is, uh, it had a very high durable response. And in, in a second model also, we, we actually saw a complete response with uh, reduced bone marrow load and a persistence of T cells in this model as well. So that brings speakers. Hello. Yeah. So that brings us to uh, what what is the function of mesothelin, and it is very likely that the mesothelin is related to uh, the extramedullary disease. So meaning because mesothelin is a cell adhesion molecule, so it promotes the extramedullary disease characteristics. And here we're showing that um, the high level expression of mesothelin leads to uh, increased engraftment rate of these uh, cells that express mesothelin. So in summary, we've identified mesothelin as a new pediatric AML immunotherapy target. And uh, I've shown you data uh, for mesothelin targeting approaches using antibody drug conjugate, bispecific antibodies, and um, we are investigating the uh, function of mesothelin expression and its relation to extramedullary disease. And with that, I want to acknowledge um, all other collaborators within NIMORS, uh, from the Fredrich Cancer Center, from Bayer Germany, and funding from these sources. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, so I don't see any questions in the chat, and I think in the interest of time, just to keep on target, I would say that we will we'll move on to the next speaker, um, and maybe if we have time at the end, we can come back for some questions. So um, thank you very much. So I'll turn it over to Shireen to introduce our next speaker. So our next speaker is Adam Olszewski, who is an associate professor of medicine at Albert Medical School of Brown University. He's also associated with the Lifespan Cancer Institute at Rhode Island Hospital. And Adam is going to talk to us about molecular predictors of central nervous system recurrence in aggressive lymphomas. Adam? Uh, thank you very much, Rain. Um, welcome, everyone. I'll share my screen here if successful. Um, so um, thank you very much for the invitation uh, and the uh, opportunity to talk to you about uh, our work on uh, molecular predictors of CNS recurrence and aggressive lymphomas. Um, I'm a clinical hematologist. I uh, treat lymphomas. And this is a very um, successful area of oncology where uh, over probably uh, two thirds of patients uh, are currently cured uh, using systemic uh, chemotherapy. Uh, but uh, there is one uh, somewhat sore point in this um, prospect, uh, which is that a significant proportion of patients uh, experience a central nervous system recurrence, either in the brain uh, or in the cerebrospinal fluid and the leptomeningeal compartment, as we call it. Uh, this remains a challenge because with the currently available therapies do not penetrate well into the CNS and may not eradicate the disease uh, from um, the, this compartment. CNS recurrences occur in about uh, six to five to six percent of uh, diffuse large B cell and Burkitt's lymphomas, and there are some subsets like high grade B cell lymphomas or so called double hit lymphomas where uh, the, this rate can increase up to 30 percent. And altogether, probably about a quarter of, of a third of uh, relapses currently are in the CNS. Uh, 
uh, a CNS relapse and diffuse large piece of lymphoma or an aggressive lymphoma is often associated with a very poor prognosis. Most patients die within two or three months of diagnosis uh, and the treatments are um, often ineffective. So there's a great interest in preventing it. Um, and we often use uh, the so-called CNS prophylaxis to uh, achieve this uh, by uh, providing intrathecal injections of chemotherapy or high dose systemic chemotherapy with um, sometimes lethal doses of agents that can penetrate into the CNS like methotrexate, which then can be rescued um, uh, in terms of their effect on other parts of the body. So how to choose patients uh, for this prophylactic therapy has been uh, an issue uh, for a long time and how to predict the risk of CNS recurrence since it does not affect um, most patients. Uh, currently, what is most commonly used uh, are these uh, clinical risk factor uh, scores the most commonly used is the CNS International Prognostic Index, which uh, combines several clinical factors that essentially reflect the burden of lymphoma, uh, but not particularly its, its um, biological characteristics, except for some extranodal involvement. Um, and they uh, can separate about 10% of patients who have a, also a 10% risk of recurrence that seems to be high enough to warrant the prophylaxis. Uh, but the problem is that over half of these relapses occur actually in the groups that are scored as lower intermediate risk. Uh, and these patients uh, do not get the benefit of uh, treatment. And moreover, there are many other uh, risk factors that were described and clinicians take into consideration involvement of the testes, breast, uh, uterus, some special um, characteristics uh, like the double hit rearrangements um, or the so-called dual expression of MEK and BCL2. And there are tons of papers describing high-risk uh, subgroups, but there is no clear uh, one, uh, one type of approach. So there are a lot of clinical needs in this area. Um, one is the uh, related as to diagnosis. Patients who are diagnosed with a relapse in the brain often require uh, an invasive neurosurgical procedure, and, and which is difficult to recover from and, and proceed with therapy. Sometimes cerebrospinal fluid examination can, can show lymphoma, but this is actually a, a low yield procedure. Maybe about 10-15% uh, of patients are diagnosed this way. Uh, there are problems that I described with the prognosis uh, as to how to best determine who has the disease in the CNS. And there are also issues related to, to treatment, uh, whether to deliver this intrathecally to in, spinal injections or systemically. So we, we thought that um, the uh, one interesting approach to uh, staging patients and, and determining who may have a risk of uh, central nervous system um, recurrence is to evaluate the cell-free DNA uh, in this disease. Uh, cell-free DNA is an expanding topic um, in uh, aggressive lymphomas altogether. Um, this is primarily because uh, lymphomas uniquely uh, create their own DNA sequence from the uh, rearrangement of the immunoglobulin gene. So each tumor or even the subclone of each tumor has its own um, specific DNA sequence that can be identified and tracked uh, that is enhanced through somatic hypermutation. So these, these are really uh, very, very unique sequences. And this um, sequence is shed by lymphoma cells in a small amount to the, to the blood and can be detected in the plasma. Um, it's, it can be quantified and has been shown that um, its amount decreases as patients uh, undergo treatment and then um, increases with a lag of several months actually before uh, an overt clinical relapse occurs or radiographically detected relapse. So this is a very promising method of monitoring and surveilling lymphomas and detecting uh, the relapse. Uh, we asked the question whether the cell free DNA can actually detect the CNS in another compartment in the cerebral spinal fluid, which is believed to be separate from plasma. Uh, we used for this uh, in collaboration a, a clonistic assay uh, by Adaptive Biotechnologies. Uh, this is a method that uh, detects um, uh, through high throughput sequencing uh, the specific DNA sequences from, from many possible uh, rearrangements of the um, immunoglobulin gene. It's actually FDA approved in clinical use for monitoring of CLL. Um, acute lymphoblastic leukemia and myeloma. And it involves actually two steps. In the first step, the primary tumor is sequenced and the so-called dominant uh, clonotypes or sequences are determined uh, from the actual biopsy. And then these clonotypes can be tracked in other samples. Uh, this often involves plasma, but in our case, it involves uh, central cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. Um, and it's, uh, it can be quantified um, in, in, in the background of other B cells or just by the number of copies. So the proof of concept, uh, this is a case of a 70-year-old woman who presented with uh, neurological symptoms with ataxia and confusion, was found to have uh, lesions in the brain on the MRI that were highly suggestive of primary CNS lymphoma, uh, but the cerebrospinal fluid evaluation was negative, but by cytology and by flow cytometry, we often get such low cellularity that our pathologists uh, do not even want to run flow cytometry or report it as insufficient. 
and then the brain biopsy confirmed diffuse large piece of lymphoma. Here we had about the biopsy on the uh, CSF. So we're able to show that the five dominant sequences, which are coming from different uh, versions of immunoglobulin gene, uh, were detected um, in not in patient's plasma, but in the uh, patient's CSF, uh, both in the fluid fraction and the cellular, cellular fraction. We then evaluated additional um, uh, six patients uh, collected prospectively who had either a brain uh, intraparenchymal brain relapse or leptomeningeal relapse, and as well as eight historical extracts from CSF. Our lab actually stores the DNA from uh, the CSF for, for performance of the um, immunoglobulin PCR, which is most often uh, non-diagnostic. And all these, all these samples had a negative test. And essentially in all these 15 samples, we detected uh, the clonotype that was available from the uh, primary biopsy. So it seemed like a highly sensitive uh, method of detection, um, including patients who had um, brain-only disease without any involvement of the uh, leptomeningeal compartment. We then moved on to the uh, question about the prognostic role uh, of this uh, assay. Uh, we enrolled over a course of about a year and a half 22 uh, newly diagnosed patients with high-risk lymphomas. These were either uh, lymphomas of uh, the diffuse large B-cell histology uh, who had um, high uh, risk uh, of CNS recurrence by the CNS IPI, or who had um, aggressive histologies associated with high risk of CNS relapse. This included high-grade B-cell lymphoma or double hit lymphoma, Burkitt lymphoma, and postnoblastic lymphoma. All these patients underwent staging uh, lumbar punctures to collect the CSF, uh, and all these uh, samples uh, tested negative by standard cytology uh, with or without flow cytometry and this diagnostic IGH-PCR. So they did not have any known CNS disease. Uh, in these patients, 36% uh, uh, had a detectable uh, clonotype from the primary tumor in the cerebrospinal fluid. Um, it in actually very small amounts, smaller than in plasma, um, and uh, kind of uh, more, although they said they are not comparable um, uh, values, uh, between um, the cellar component or the spun down uh, cell pellet, uh, where we could detect probably about, um, you know, one in 1% 1 of cells uh, containing the clonotype versus a small number of copies. Uh, which was often less than 10 per milliliter. And you know we mo mostly get five milliliters of the CSF in the uh, SLR fluid. Uh, we of course wanted to make sure that uh, we are not just seeing a comp contamination from blood since uh, these sequences are circulating in plasma. Um, so we used as a correlate of uh, contamination by blood uh, the number of white cells and red cells present in the clinical sample for the, from the CSF. And we did not see any uh, significant correlation between the number of red cells and the number of copies of the sulfur DNA um, or the uh, copies uh, per um, um, B cells or uh, per million B cells. We also collected uh, 15 parallel plasma samples from patients. And there, were also, there was also no significant correlation between the amount of clonotypic sequences uh, in the plasma and in the CSF with some patients having very high plasma loads, but no CSF involvement and others having a significant uh, load in the CSF, but not that much in the plasma. So uh, we then observed these patients for a median of uh, a year about, or right now it's, it's probably a little more than a year. And um, two of them developed CNS relapse, so two out of 22, about 10%, which was maybe predictable from, the, from their uh, baseline high CNS IPI score. Uh, both of these patients who had a relapse uh, did have a positive um, uh, sulfur DNA uh, assay at diagnosis, and both actually had undergone a standard intrathecal uh, prophylactic therapy. Uh, in contrast, no patients who had a negative assay at diagnosis develop any relapse. The confidence interval on the estimates are, of course, um, wide in this um, fairly small and somewhat pilot sample, but uh, it appears that the test might differentiate patients who have with standard therapy about 30% risk of recurrence versus none. So in conclusion, it appears that cell-free DNA might have a high sensitivity to detect parenchymal CNS lymphomas. There are now uh, several other studies that are, that are tracking either somatic mutations in tumors. Um, I haven't seen yet studies that, that would use the clonotypic assays in the CSF, and they detect um, approximately about 80% uh, of primary CNS lymphomas in the, in the cerebrospinal fluid. There doesn't seem to be any correlation between uh, the load of sequences and the uh, plasma and the CSF. So it suggests that these are truly separate compartments from, from the point of view of this assay. 
And probably about a third of patients who are considered high risk by their clinical factors have a positive um, um, or detectable uh, chronotypic uh, sequence in their uh, cerebrospinal fluid. And these are the patients who are at high risk of recurrence, while those who, despite clinical risk, have, a, have no detectable sequences may have a much lower risk, probably lower than um, people with or, or patients with um, low risk uh, CNS disease. Um, well, it's very difficult to translate these results to treatment at this point because all these patients underwent standard treatment, so we cannot really tell anything about the treatment efficacy. And the downside of this assessment is that it requires lumbar puncture um, for staging. So at the same time, we're uh, interested in uh, looking at the molecular um, structure and, and, and makeup of uh, aggressive lymphomas. Uh, we have now known that so the most common diffuse RP cell lymphoma is really a, a composite of many different diseases with very specific uh, genomic um, um, clusters of mutations. Um, historically, these tumors were uh, classified on the basis of their gene expression profiling, uh, approximated by immunohistochemistry immu into the germinal center and non-germinal center groups. And now there's at least six, uh, if not even more, uh, subgroups. There are pretty well actually uh, clear cuts um, in a quick way separated uh, from the point of view of genomics. Interestingly, the diffuse RB cell lymphoma that is localized in the, in the brain, the so-called primary CNS lymphoma, shares the genomic characteristics with some other external lymphomas that for a long time were known to have a high risk of future uh, central nervous system relapse. So the lymphomas that are initiate in the testicle, breast, and uterus are known to have a very high risk of future CNS recurrence and are routinely given a CNS prophylaxis, and they actually have very similar genomic makeup to primary CNS lymphoma. Um, in particular, the cluster of the so-called uh, MIDE88 mutated and CD79B mutated, or MCD, which is our B cell lymphoma, uh, contains these mutations in MIDE88 and CD79B. And they also seem to be highly dependent on um, immune evasion with overexpression and amplification of the uh, PDL1, which is a checkpoint uh, molecule. And uh, this cluster is, is, is a subcluster of the uh, older uh, activated B cell uh, lymphoma uh, with overall poor prognosis, but not all patients obviously develop uh, CNS disease. Uh, so a colleague of mine, um, Tom Alela, uh, has collected 26 samples of patients uh, with diffuse B cell lymphoma who either had um, recurrence in localized to the central nervous system versus those who had systemic only recurrence without CNS involvement and compare the uh, genomic makeup of these tumors. There were no significant clinical predictors uh, that, would, that were associated with CNS only disease. All these uh, patients had uh, pretty aggressive tumors uh, with high uh, burden, um, uh, aggressive characteristics uh, biologically. And um, most of them actually had um, intermediate and low CNS score. In this IPI score, so only 15% of patients were with CNS recurrence in, the, in our cohorts had a high CNS IPI. Uh, these, all these tumors were subjected to a clinical grade sequencing of uh, 592 uh, cancer related genes uh, performed mostly by uh, CARIS, but also uh, partly by Foundation Medicine. And we then um, observed uh, what were the clusters that uh, were associated with uh, CNS recurrence. Uh, we used the, um, um, the so-called LymphGen classifier, which on the basis of a mutational panel can uh, classify tumors into several uh, subtypes. Uh, but this classifier often leaves a lot of tumors, probably about half of tumors as unclassifiable. So we also used a, a so-called hierarchical classifier, which was actually developed for this uh, study, uh, focusing on the, this MCD group with MIDE88 uh, MIDE mutation uh, or some additional mutations uh, from this cluster. Uh, and mutations associated with high grade cell lymphomas. We observed that the uh, MCD cluster was actually um, more, very common in both systemic and CNS relapses, but uh, predominated in the CNS relapses. Uh, the other is probably constituted about uh, over 40% uh, of these patients. The other almost half of patients included those who had high grade B cell lymphoma and mostly double hit lymphomas or those, uh, those with P53 mutation. And these lymphomas also had significant risk um, or the prevalence in the uh, systemic uh, group. So the MCD uh, appeared to be uh, significantly increased in the uh, CNS relapse uh, as we uh, hypothesized and expected. 
we compare this uh, prevalence of the MCD subtype uh, between two comparative data sets, so, which uh, sequenced uh, large cohorts of patients with unselected diffuse B cell lymphoma. So one was from uh, Dana Farber and one was from uh, British Columbia uh, Cancer Agency. And we used both of these classifiers, the lymph gen and the uh, hierarchical cluster uh, classifier to uh, compare the subtypes. And in both, um, Cases we found that the prevalence of the MCD cluster was much higher in our cohorts uh, than in the, the unselected cohorts, um, and uh, both by the lymph node classifier and by the uh, hierarchical one. To validate this, we also uh, used two publicly available uh, data sets uh, that actually had recorded uh, the um, presence of CNS uh, recurrence in their patients. So one was a, a 1,500 um, uh, patient uh, clinical trial, a uh, called Goya trial. Uh, which enrolled patients uh, treated with um, standard chemotherapy versus standard chemotherapy with a substitution of uh, a different monoclonal antibody into the so-called RCHOP, they received the GCHOP. Uh, and in this very large trial um, with non-selection bias, only about 12 pa patients developed CNS relapse, and the MCD cluster was also enriched among these 12 patients, obviously very small data sets. In another uh, 400 uh, sequenced uh, the visual B cell uh, group, uh, we also observed an increased um, sub, um, prevalence of the MCD subtype, although less pronounced, I have to say, uh, than um, um, compared to uh, patients who did not have a CNS relapse. So it appears that the traditional- uh, uh, Adam, I'm gonna give you a time warning. You're at time now, so I'd ask you to, to finish up as soon as you can, thanks. Uh, I think we, we can uh, replace the uh, older clinical uh, stratification uh, where we use the CNS IPI and various uh, clinical features into an over molecular stratification to predict risk of CNS relapse um, using the high-risk genomic subtype and potentially also staging LP among patients uh, who undergo it because it's certain clinical uh, risk factors. And now can think about translating it into uh, future treatment. This actually is a somewhat sore point because there are multiple studies showing that um, uh, doing the standard uh, CNS prophylaxis is not effective, whether it's given intrathecally or intravenously. Um, this is a very controversial area, but um, our work could potentially be translated into change in treatment where a patients at low risk could omit treatment altogether, while those at high risk could undergo actually intensified prophylaxis with more agents that are penetrating the CNS. So thank you very much um, uh, for the attention, and thank you for my collaborators, both on the clinical side and the molecular pathology side and um, in our clinical research office. Thank you, Adam. Great talk. Um, so we have one question from Shireen in the chat, so I can read it. It's um, most uh, MYD88L265P mutations are found in ABCDLBCL. Is that the case in your patient cohort used, or did you use both um, DLBCL subtypes in your analysis? So the, the MC, the uh, MYD88 mutation is actually just only a small subgroup of the uh, ABC tumors. There are many ABC tumors, and the, the cluster associated with my DDA, the CD79B mutations and CDKN28 deletions is only a, a small subgroup of it, very well defined. Um, the, 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 the classification of ABC and GCB tumors is somewhat falling out of favor because it's very um, difficult to reproduce. It requires an expression profiling, which has never been translated into clinical practice. So I think people will now be most looking at these small, smaller but well-defined genomic subtypes. Um, and um, in our practice, we also don't use gene expression profiling. So all these tumors were classified as ABC on the basis of immunohistochemistry, um, which is known to misclassify over 30% of patients. But yes, they, by definition, are activated B-cell lymphomas. However, the other group, the high-grade B-cell lymphoma group uh, that also has a high risk of CNS relapse, these are almost strictly germinal-centered uh, tumors with either P53 mutations or MIC rearrangements that are somewhat um, resembling Burkitt lymphoma. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so we will move on to our next speaker. Thank you, Adam. Um, so our next speaker is our co-chair, um, Dr. Shireen Osawa, uh, who's Associate Professor of Immunology in the Department of Molecular, Cellular, and Biomedical Sciences at the University of New Hampshire. Um, so Shireen is going to tell us about a novel role for GLE2 and malignant B cells and the tumor microenvironment. Thanks, Shireen. Thank you very much. Can everybody see my screen okay? Yeah, all good. Perfect. 
Um, so I'm going to talk today about a novel role for the transcription factor GLI2 in both the malignant B cells as well as the tumor microenvironment. Um, GLI proteins were initially identified as effectors of the hedgehog signaling pathway, and this pathway has the patched receptor, which normally inhibits the smoothened signal transduction subunit in the absence of hedgehog ligand. However, once the ligand binds, this removes the inhibition that patched has on smoothen and allows downstream signaling and ultimately activation of these GLI proteins, which translocate to the nucleus and mediate gene expression. <clears throat> And early studies of this um, signaling pathway um, resulted in a variety of um, uh, molecules that were used in clinical trials, mostly targeting smoothen to inhibit signal transduction. And they didn't really show the promise that we had expected um, in, in, um, in the clinical setting. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is this pathway is very important in both embryonic development and of course um, has been looked at in a variety of cancers and shown to be over um, activated. <clears throat> Um, so even in the absence of signaling through the smoothened um, uh, subunit, we don't see really a lot of clinical responses. And this is because we know that several other molecules such as EGF signaling, TGF beta signaling, and CCR3 signaling can also activate GLI independent of signaling from smoothened. There are three members of the GLI family, GLI1, GLI2, and GLI3. These are known as zinc finger transcription factors because they all have the characteristic five zinc finger uh, repeats. Um, they all have a, a transactivation domain, which is shown here in green. And only the GLI2 and GLI3 members have this N-terminal uh, repressor domain, which means GLI2 and GLI3 can act as both transcriptional activators and repressors, while GLI1 only activates transcription. And in the context of hedgehog signaling, GLI1 and 2 are considered activation, activators of the pathway, while GLI3 is typically known as a repressor of hedgehog signaling. Um, our lab has really focused on GLI2. And like I mentioned, you know, initially we knew that hedgehog signaling regulated the activity of GLI2, but now we know that other pathways, including PI3 kinase, EGF signaling can regulate the activity of the protein, while CCL5 signaling through CCR3 and TGF beta signaling through SMADs can regulate the expression of GLI2 and lead to a change in its biological activity. The disease model we use is very interesting. Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, or WM, is a B-cell lymphoma. Um, and if we look at this schematic showing the different stages of B-cell development, WM sits here between lymphoma and myeloma because the malignant cells in WM share phenotypic characteristics that are similar to both mature B cells and plasma cells. And one of the hallmarks of this disease is the overproduction of a monoclonal IgM protein that is associated with significant symptoms in patients. One thing worth mentioning is that um, these cells are unable to undergo class switch recombination to switch the antibody isotype from IgM to any of the other um, Ig isotypes. Um, we became interested in looking at the tumor microenvironment, everything around the tumor cells. And in the context of the bone marrow, there is um, the acellular components, which includes the cytokine milieu, as well as the extracellular matrix. And the cellular components include a variety of immune cells, as well as the stromal and endothelial cells. What we focused on is looking at the interaction between bone marrow stromal cells and malignant B cells in WM and the role and the regulation of cytokines and how this affects malignant cell properties. And ultimately, by looking at all these characteristics, our goal is to facilitate the development of novel therapeutic approaches for patients based on a fundamental understanding of the signaling that occurs in the tumor microenvironment and how that affects the malignant cells. So early on, we had published this work looking at CCL5 um, signaling through CCR3, uh, PI3 kinase AKT, which ultimately activates NF-kappa-B. And this leads to regulation of GLI2 um, mRNA and protein expression. GLI2 then binds and regulates the expression and secretion of IL-6. And IL-6 is well known to play a role in both normal and malignant B cell biology, where it regulates Ig production, as well as proliferation of these cells. And this is true as well in WM, where IL-6 promotes IgM secretion, and it also promotes proliferation of these cells. <clears throat> 
And so our goal was to try and target the interaction between the tumor microenvironment and the malignant cells. And we used tocilizumab, which is an antibody targeting the IL-6 receptor. It binds to it and prevents signaling and also prevents IL-6 from being able to bind to its receptor on the malignant cells. We took immunocompromised mice and we injected them with both tumor cells and stromal cells from bone marrow stromal cells. And um, a week after uh, implanting the tumors, we initiated therapy with tocilizumab every other day for a total period of five weeks. And we evaluated tumor survival as well as um, tumor growth and IgE secretion. There really was no difference in tumor survival, but we did see a difference in uh, a, a reduction in the tumor growth rate in mice that were treated with tocilizumab. Um, and this was true for both, uh, we had two groups of mice injected with two different cell lines for WM. We do see a difference in, in the way the tumors grow in mice uh, between the two cell lines. And hopefully this represents the heterogeneity that we see um, in, in patients as well. And day 14, we looked at the, the tumor growth rate as well as tumor volume, and we see a significant reduction. And we specifically looked at all day 14 because we had all mice um, still um, alive at that point. When we looked at human IgM secretion in mouse serum, we saw a significant reduction in IgM in one of the two cell lines, two groups of mice injected with these cells. So we saw a reduction in IgM secretion in the VCWM group, but not in the RPCI group. And this variability in response, again, in, in the cell lines may represent the variability that we see in patients. So although we were um, excited that blocking the effects of the tumor microenvironment um, had reduced the, the tumor growth rate, um, the results with IgM secretion was variable. And we wondered if perhaps targeting GLE2 rather than targeting IL-6 would be a better therapeutic option um, since GLE2 we're showing here targeting IL-6, but we've also shown that it targets other molecules such as CD4, D ligand, uh, among others, and those also promote um, malignant cells. So before we could do that, in order to, to target really uh, GLE2, we didn't know what GLE2 did to the malignant cells themselves. And so, so we looked at the role of GLE2 on WM biology. And we approached this by using uh, GLE antagonists, so GANT61, and we looked at treated WM cells with this antagonist, and we found a significant reduction in IgM secretion in vitro um, by these WM cells. However, when we use cyclopamine, which is an inhibitor of smoothened, so this would target hedgehog signaling, we really didn't see an effect on um, IgM secretion. And we took the approach of looking at the effect of GLE inhibition on cytokine receptors for the cytokines that have been shown to regulate um, IgM. And we found here that cells treated with the GLE antagonist um, had reduced IL-6 receptor expression. And we confirmed this by quantitative PCR. And we also used short hairpin RNA to target GLE2 in WM cells. And we saw in both a reduction in GLE2 expression as well as a reduction in IL-6 expression. And this also resulted in a reduction in um, IL-6 uh, receptor protein expression. And then we used two different SHRNAs targeting GLE2, and we see a reduction in GLE2 expression, a reduction in IL-6 expression, and a reduction in IgM secretion in the culture supernatants of these cells. And finally, um, what we did is we knocked down GLE2 with short hairpin RNA to target GLE2, and then overexpressed IL-6 receptor. And we found that overexpression of the IL-6 receptor can rescue the effect of GLE2 loss on IgM secretion in multiple WM cell lines. So at this point, we had shown this with cell lines, but we wanted to use a primary cell model to show that this phenomena was true. And so we used B1 cells from mice as a primary cell model. These cells secrete natural IgM in the absence of any stimulation, and they're found in the pleural and the peritoneal cavities. So we isolated peritoneal cells from mice, and we cultured them in the presence or absence of Li inhibition using GANT61. We gated first on the lymphocytes, then looked at specifically the B cells, and then looked at both B1 and the B2 populations. And when we look at the B1 cells, we saw a reduction in IL-6 receptor expression in cells that were treated with the GLE inhibitor. <clears throat> 
This also resulted in a reduction in secretion of IgM by total peritoneal cells in this culture. We then purified the B1A specifically, um, and we found that these B1 cells um, express GLI1, GLI2, and GLI3. And also when we treat them with the GLI antagonist, there was a significant reduction. This was actually below detection levels of the IgM assay. So we, we figured that GLI2 would have a beneficial effect because it targets both the malignant cells as well as the tumor microenvironment. And in terms of the malignant cells, it targets them via regulation of IL-6 receptor. And as I mentioned earlier, IL-6 is known to target um, IgM secretion. But we didn't know what really uh, GLI2 does to normal B cells, the majority of B cells, which are the B2 B cell population. So to better understand that, GLI2 deficient mice are embryonically lethal. So we generated mice with GLI2 um, knockout in B cells using uh, by crossing GLI2 flux mice with CD19 Cree mice. Um, these mice express Cree, they express the recombined GLI2 allele, and all of them express the flux allele. We didn't see any difference in the overall survival of mice and their bone marrow populations appeared comparable in both groups of mice. B cell numbers appeared similar also in both groups of mice and um, B cell development in the spleen appeared comparable whether we looked at the transitional uh, B cells or the follicular and marginal zone B cells. So it didn't appear that GLI2 had an effect on uh, B cell development. We had expected to see a reduction in IgM levels and were surprised that IgM levels were comparable in both groups, although there was a significant reduction, although very small, in IgG1 levels in the absence of GLI2. But we took out total splenocytes and we stimulated them with lipopolysaccharide just to activate B cells. And in the wild type mice, we saw an induction in IgM that was very similar in the absence of GLI2. But when we looked at IgG secretion, we saw a significant increase in IgG, total IgG secretion in the absence of GLI2. And this was surprising because this suggested that GLI2 would negatively um, regulate class switching. Um, and when we looked at different Ig isotypes, we found that this was mediated by IgG1 and not any of the other isotypes. When we did this in vivo, the patterns were similar, but not statistically significant. And we're hoping as we build the numbers, we see this more clearly. When we stimulate mice with, um, um, with uh, LPS, IgM levels were comparable, but IgG levels also appeared higher, although this was not statistically significant. So like I said, we, this was interesting because we were looking at class switching. So we did a class switch assay in vitro by taking out the B cells from these mice. And we looked specifically at IgA, IgG1, 2B, and IgG3. And we found that IgG1 levels were significantly higher. And this is looking by flow cytometry at surface IgG1 expression. Um, and this was higher in the absence of GLI2. While this is interesting, but in normal B cells, we know class switching always occurs. So we took it back to WM where we see a lack of class switching and we treated WM cells with the GLI antagonist, GANT61, and looked at expression of the different Ig isotypes. We see a reduction in um, IgM expression and there appeared to be an induction in both IgG2 and IgG4 um, expression in WM cells. So this was actually more interesting because we know that WM cells fail to undergo class switching. Um, whether it's a direct effect or indirect effect, we weren't sure, but um, uh, these are preliminary studies where we treated with the GLI antagonist and looked at expression of the genes that we know are important for class switching. And we see an induction in AID expression. We see an induction in RAG1 and RAG2 proteins. And all these three genes are important for class switching to occur. So to summarize what we think is going on, we know that GLI2 plays a role in um, the tumor microenvironment. It regulates IL-6 among other cytokines that are known to mediate um, the biology of WM cells. In the, the malignant cells themselves, we know that GLI2 regulates um, IgM secretion um, via regulation of IL-6 receptor. And more recent data suggesting that it can potentially play a role in class switching. Whether this holds true or not, we're just beginning to dissect what happens to the VDJ um, region. And we're looking at indirect effects through AID and RAG1 and 2 expression.
I'm going to stop here um, by acknowledging the variety of folks in the lab, current and past members who have contributed to this project, um, our various collaborators who have helped us in, in different ways, and the various funding agencies. Um, and we're fortunate to be uh, funded by the CIBER, uh, which is the UNH COBRE, um, who provided significant funds to help with a variety of different um, um, uh, experiments in this study. I'd be happy to take questions. All right, thank you very much, Shireen. Great talk. Um, we have a question from Mary Jo. Um, does GLE2 also play a role in IL-6 production by malignant cells? So we haven't looked at that, mainly because at the time we had um, not all of them. So BCWM does not secrete um, IL-6, so it made it hard to look at that. Um, we don't know is the answer to that. And then also in WM, one thing to mention is that um, we don't really see a lot of autocrine IL-6 in WM, unlike myeloma, where there's a lot of autocrine IL-6 production. So Shireen, I'm sure you may have addressed this, but the mechanism by which these WM cells have inactivated class switch recombination, is that well understood, poorly understood? Poorly understood. So yeah. early studies, I think in the early 2000s, people had looked at class switch machinery, which as you know, changes you know, yeah. every year. Um, and it, it looked apparently normal, but there was a recent study that looked at reduced AID expression in WM cells. And so we're thinking, that's what, what made us look at AID expression in response to GLE inhibition. So like I said, we're just beginning to look at that. We're very excited by this data and, and trying to dissect really how GLE2 is, is playing a role in that. Um, do these cells respond to proteasome inhibitors? I, I think like yes, they do. Moment, they do. Yep, they do, but they're pretty toxic. So like with everything else. Okay. All right. Thank you. So actually we have a question from Adam. Um, would these mechanisms have a role in the cytokine release syndrome associated with immune cell therapies? These are um, IL-6 mediated. So, you know, I, we haven't really looked at it, but I think it would because, you know, we, we know that GLE2 can regulate TGF beta. We know that it can regulate IL-6. We know it can regulate IL-6 receptor. We know it regulates CD40 ligand. So there are multiple cytokine targets for GLE2, and this suggests that it may play a role in, in cytokine release syndrome. All right. All right, thank you very much. So we are going to move on to our next speaker. And actually, Shireen, you, you're up again to introduce yep. our next speaker. So um, yeah, off you go. Thank you. Um, so our next speaker is Aaron Crouchy, who's a research scientist and the director of medical bioinformatics at Nimmer's Children's Hospital in Wilmington, Delaware. And she's going to talk to us about development and implementation of a pediatric oncology genomics program, a focus on leukemias and the development of next gen sequencing techniques. Erin? Thank you. Um, my video is blocked by the host. Um, I don't know if you would want to um, unblock me. Okay. Stand by one moment. You're good. Yeah, you're good. You're good. Okay. And my screen now is on. You can see my screen as well? Yes. Yeah, all good. Okay. Okay, turn it one more time. There we go. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much for the invitation to um, talk today. Um, I'm going to focus a little bit on the analysis of genomic landscape of pediatric AML as um, in the, I'm sorry, this is in the way. Don't know how to minimize. There we go. Um, the genomic landscape of pediatric AML is a utility for predicting outcome and tracking disease. Um, we have we are in the process of implementing both a research next generation sequencing laboratory at Nemours specific for pediatric oncology, and we're also implementing a CLIA diagnostic lab. Um, it's very hard in personalized genomics to deliver an N of one result and be able to accurately interpret that, and that's especially true when it comes to pediatric cancers. So we've been very fortunate to be able to couple this with our research studies where we can actually um, use de-identified population trends to better interpret, interpret and utilize personalized data. Um, through our research efforts, which I'm going to focus today's talk on, we have been able to really create a foundation for developing clinical assays that are very specific 
for finding very unique mutations that seem to be more um, prominent in children versus adults. And we heard Anali Sonali speak a little bit about that during her talk. Um, so the focus is gonna be on pediatric AML. Um, and again, as we heard from Sonali, relapse is a significant problem for AML and still high risk ALL with less than 70% um, overall survival rate, five year survival rate. Um, there are significant treatment related adverse events as well. As Sonali mentioned, uh, the treatments are still pretty um, harsh and, and very nonspecific. Um, this is one of the um, major accomplishments that's really come out of foundation medicine and also the target initiative was that the landscape, the genomic or somatic landscape of children is very different compared to adults. Um, and this really impacted genomic studies because we were trying to find adult mutations in children um, and they simply just don't have them. And what you're looking at here is the fusion um, prevalence versus mutations per patient with the fusions in blue and the more single nucleotide or point mutations in green. And there's a strong correlation with age, and these are grouped by age, two, two to 10, 10 to 20, and so forth, where you see a really strong prevalence of structural rearrangements. So these are regions of the genome that have significantly rearranged in children, and these decrease with age. And with age, in terms of AML, we see an increase of single nucleotide variant. So over time, adults seem to acquire very small mutations, whereas children who have AML um, at a very early stage and sometimes even born, uh, infant leukemia, born with these very um, abnormal and large genomic rearrangements. Um, so we first set off um, back a long time ago, actually about five years ago, on how to figure out how to improve next generation sequencing um, processes to be able to capture, identify, annotate appropriately these very complex genomic rearrangements. And there's a lot of steps along the way um, in terms of which really can impact how you do the wet bench or the capturing of those molecules, how you align them to the genome, how you detect them, and then ultimately annotate them. And in 2020, we published um, a molecular toolbox paper, which pretty much described the need to have multiple different strategies, both DNA and RNA, to really offer an appropriate diagnostic platform for children that have pediatric AML. Uh, we use a very specialized technique called air correction. Um, this allows us to um, have very low levels of detection um, for both structural variants and also indels. Uh, the study design that we're going to review today um, was actually a clinical trial conducted by the Children's Oncology Group, termed AAML 1031. There were 800 unique subjects or children um, enrolled who had um, pediatric AML. Uh, samples were collected at time of diagnosis and remission on every single um, patient. And for those that relapsed, a third sample was collected at time of relapse. Um, because of our previous um, data back in 2020, we really wanted to have a comprehensive next generation sequencing in our genomic data set to work with. And with that, we set out to um, collect or generate whole genome sequencing. Uh, we created a, a very specific panel, um, a DNA panel using anchored multiplex PCR technology. And we also had a hybridization panel um, that we worked with Illumina um, with to create a spe specific for children. Um, we also really needed to be able to analyze the RNA space because again, children have these large structural rearrangements and they're very challenging to detect in DNA with short read sequencing technology. So we created a targeted RNA panel as well um, using anchored multiplex PCR and also bulk sequencing our RNA-seq. Uh, the important part of anchored multiplex PCR, this is a technology that we work with Archer Diagnostics with, is that you only lay down one gene-specific primer, and you don't actually have to know what the downstream rearrangement is for your um, gene of interest, um, because you're only laying down one gene-specific primer. Because these gene-specific primers have UMIs or unique molecular indexes, you're, allowed, you're able to air correct um, and really detect low allelic events. This entire study has resulted in hundreds of terabytes of raw data. 
hundreds of terabytes of process data and millions of data features or variants. Um, so this is really quickly transitioned into a data science project as well, in terms of being able to manage, analyze, process, and now um, hopefully interpret and apply some meaning to this wonderful data set. So if we look at residual disease measured by flow cytometry for AML 1031, there is a strong um, a sort of correlation or outcome based on whether or not you're able to clear your disease as measured by flow cytometry and whether or not um, how likely you are to survive. Uh, the blue line represents children who were negative based on flow cytometry residual disease analysis at time of end of induction, where the red line is residual disease positive as measured by flow. By flow. I'm going to abbreviate this from now on as FRD. And so one of the first questions we wanted to ask was, can you use molecular markers as a signature for residual disease? And again, we heard from a previous speaker as well that there are some FDA approved MRD assays out there, but none for pediatric AML. And so when we were pretty, I would say naive when we started this and thought, well, certainly this makes sense, right? If you can find the DNA marker or a genomic variant, that should correlate well with residual disease. Um, so as a starting point in the DNA, and we noticed really quick, and this has been um, supported by others in literature, that there's not a lot of somatic signature in, in the DNA um, for a single subject. And the graph on the left, what you're looking at is the variant allele frequency at time of diagnosis, end of induction, and relapse. So each line represents a single variant being tracked over time. And not surprising in DNA, we find a lot of diversity at very low levels within the um, hemopoietic stem cell compartment, which is to be expected. But we don't find a lot of classical, what we call V-shaped or variants that are responding to treatment because there's just not a lot of somatic markers within the DNA. However, we have noticed that there is quite a, um, a complexity in germline and rare variants Per, um, per these subjects, and these are 720 subjects plotted here in this plot here, where we see some really interesting like NF1, um, the, um, the, 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 uh, the GATA genes and so forth, where they don't actually have somatic mutations, but they have very rare germline events that we think are obviously important um, for understanding pediatric um, AML. So with this, we decided to also focus on RNA. Um, and I can tell you from the DNA project, um, even with driver mutations, such as the FLT3 and turnum tandem duplication, um, which is we find in the DNA, um, when we plot the Kaplan-Meier curves um, just using a single DNA variant in terms of residual disease, it's not that easy of a relationship. And we strongly believe that it's a combination of variants um, or these markers that need to be used from a molecular standpoint to truly understand um, residual disease. Um, so we focus then on RNA as well. And um, this is data from 682 patients at time of diagnosis. And the first thing that we wanted to do was just simply benchmark our AMP technology against traditional karyotype um, and fish, because if you can't accurately find these fusions at time of diagnosis and you wanna track them through a disease course, um, you need to make sure that you're you know, accurately identifying them. Um, and what, what I can say here is that we that we are, um, we typically identify um, nearly 100% specificity and sensitivity um, with traditional methods. There's always some outliers um, and we typically validate those. And generally the NGS is, is um, comes out as being more sensitive. And we have seen that sometimes karyotyping is just missing these low allelic events. Um, in this particular example, which is a very common and well-known fusion event that takes place in children, um, even at time of diagnosis, so independent of residual disease, um, you see a, a, a huge difference in outcome um, for these children. And this is important as we continue to transition to understanding molecular landscapes and how they can be used to predict or understand outcome. So here's a case study from a child who had flow residual disease at 0.9%. Um, they did not relapse and they did survive. When we look at the next generation sequencing results for this, 
um, this particular child did not have this trans this um, translocation event or fusion happening at end of induction. We did not detect it at um, in the in the RNA. Um, so it didn't correlate well with the flow residual disease in that aspect. However, we did find other markers, um, potential stomatic markers, um, that were very prevalent um, still at time of end of induction. And again, this child did not relapse and they, they are still alive. So clearly there's a, there's a complex relationship between genomic markers and flow residual disease. Um, here's another example where this particular child had flow residual disease at 0.1% at time of end induction. They unfortunately did not survive. Um, they did relapse quickly and did not survive. And for this particular child, we did find this uh, fusion event still, unfortunately, at a fairly high percentage sticking around after induction. And so we're really working hard at this point in time to understand how to use these molecular signatures as a um, sort of a proxy or determination of residual disease. So we've had two approaches to this. One is to use a count probability distribution to determine molecular residual disease via variant data. So actually using those BAFs and or um, percentages of these structural variants and correlation with the flow-based immune profiling molecular disease. We've also tried expression, expression patterns at time of diagnosis as a molecular sort of composition to determine if we can um, predict outcome via machine learning techniques. So for approach one, we're using actually LeCam's theorem. Um, LeCam was a mathematician from the 1960s who came up with this um, really nice uh, probability um, distribution that we are now applying um, in a novel way to next generation sequencing data. And this just is just an example. So basically what you're doing here is you're looking at the total number of allelic observations for all somatic mutations within a subject. In this example, it's 20. Then you calculate your lambda, which is sort of the sum of the depth of all of those somatic events times the air rate. An air rate is just tells us how noisy that position is, is within the background and next generation sequencing data. And you do this for each variant position within a single subject, and then you take the sum of that, you run then a Poisson test, and from that you get a p-value and you start to determine whether or not there was enough allelic observations to actually consider this particular patient as residual disease positive or negative. From here, we actually have the um, true values because we were, this is a retrospective study, so we know who survived, we knew who had event um, free survival, overall survival, flow data, and so forth. From this, we can generate uh, calculating our false positives and our false negatives, our rock curves to determine whether or not how well we're doing at our sensitivity and specificity for calculating residual disease. We've been training now on flow data. This is working quite well. Um, there are some limitations within this population, which is why we also wanted to incorporate approach two, um, which is can we predict a time of diagnosis? So independent of what your signature is at end of induction, is there a stronger signature there potentially for determining outcome? And we focused on this because we noticed again that some of these structural variants and complex rearrangements really correlate um, in some ways stronger than residual disease with outcome. So for this particular um, experimental design, we used a thousand pediatric AML subjects sequence at time of diagnosis via RNA-seq. So we had the 800 that were part of 1031 plus a few hundred that were part of 0531, which was another COG clinical trial. We used gene count data generated via Callisto, and we used a combination of different feature selection techniques and classifiers were tested. Subjects were divided into a training and test set and split at 50-50 or 75-25, and ROC curves were generated. Um, this is hot off the press, so this is um, our rock curves. We just submitted this for ASH, um, where we're trying to actually predict children who have um, issues with clearing disease or residual disease based on flow cytometry. And what you're looking at here is the area under the curves, and what we varied the number of features on um, which are genes that were allowed to go into this. 
Uh, we're using a novel feature selection technique called SHAP or Shapley values, which has been traditionally applied in social media, social networking, and so forth. We have tried traditional techniques like differential gene expressions and so forth, but we find that they often fall short in really analyzing combinations of gene expression patterns versus a single gene. And from here, what you can see is that the Shapley feature tech the Shapley feature um, selection technique combined with a gradient boosting is yielding almost an area under the curve of 0.9. So this means with about 300 features or genes um, analyzed at time of diagnosis, that we can classify or predict children that are likely to um, clear their disease and survive versus children that are not. When we took those 300 um, features that were selected via Shapley and ran them through a GSEA, through the Broad Institute's GSE platform, this was the top um, pathway that came up, which is a chemotherapy resistance. Um, so there does seem to be a strong signature at time of diagnosis, even before treatment is administered, that could potentially be used to predict who is going to respond or have a favorable outcome. Um, at this time, I'd like to thank Dr. Andy Cole, the director of the Nemours Center for Cancer and Blood Disorders at Nemours, Dr. Todd Drulli at Washington University School of Medicine. Um, he is the PI in our R01, Mauricio Ferrada and Sunita from University of Delaware. Um, they have worked extensively on the machine learning techniques with us. And lab members from the team, Carl, Jeff, um, Ben, and Alan, our funding is from the NIH, the Mosley Foundation, and the Delaware CTR program. Um, this is a, my last slide and just wanted to highlight, um, it's really has been fun to develop and implement a genomics um, platform at Nemours and it's really taken a very unique team structure. Um, we're very fortunate to have people with very diverse skill sets, bioinformaticians and data analysts to application developers and molecular biologists who actually run the next Seek 550 in the lab. Um, so we have high quality data to do these analysis with. So with that, I thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you very much. Um, let me check the chat box for questions. Um, I'm not seeing any questions. Um, so can I ask, I think you, you just mentioned it. I think you, you, you mentioned the next 500 in your, in your lab. Mm -hmm. So are, are you guys doing all your sequencing in-house or do you farm out to some of these newer companies? And maybe um, comment on that. Yep, we do all of our um, clinical sequencing, obviously, in-house. Um, for this particular project, for the 800 samples, we did outsource that. That was a little much for our team um, to be able to handle with the next Seek 550. Um, but typically, we run all projects now um, in-house if there are 200 or less samples. Um, once you get above 200, it can be a little bit cheaper to outsource to um, one of the larger sequencing facilities. Um, and just kind of a follow up question. So when you talk about these complex structural rearrangements, so, so how are you characterizing those using your sequencing approach? What, what? Yep. So um, we have found and I didn't show this um, data that bulk sequencing or RNA seq um, is not as sensitive for finding these sort of structural and complex rearrangements. Um, and we've been focusing on the AMP technology, which is the anchored multiplex PCR, um, which, which is nice about AMP. And it, it really reminds me um, back in the day when I was doing crop genetics and you would insert a gene into a, into a plant and you had no idea where it inserted. And so you'd only be able to lay down one gene specific primer and you would have to keep going through sort of a nested approach to be able to figure out where it inserted into the genome. And this is a very similar strategy. We have absolutely no idea. We know that certain genes are very promiscuous and they'll fuse with just about anything. For example, KM2TA will fuse, has over 90 reported fusion partners and I'm sure more to come. And so with the AMP technology that we're using to identify and characterize these structural variants, all you have to know is the dominant sort of fusion partners. What, what are the most dominant genes that sort of go into rearrangements? And you don't have to know what's downstream of that to be able to appropriately capture and sequence them. An interesting part about the AMP technology is that there is no size selection. So you don't always get excellent bridge amplification in the Lumina platform for the larger molecules that you're capturing, um, but it certainly seems to be more sensitive than RNA-seq for identifying those particular rearrangements. Okay, great. Thanks for clarifying. Mm -hmm. All right.
Excellent. So if I see no further questions, I think we'll move on. Um, Aaron, thanks again. Um, our next speaker is um, Sarah Walker, who is an assistant professor in molecular, cellular and biomedical sciences in University of New Hampshire. And Sarah is going to talk to us about the role of STAT3 in ovarian cancer. Um, thanks, Sarah. And I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks. So I um, can you hear me? I had to change some computers because I've been having some internet issues. Okay, your volume is a little low if, if that can be adjusted, but otherwise we can we can see and I'll, hear you. Okay, I'll try to be a little bit louder. I had to change some of my um, my headset wouldn't work with the other one. All right. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So, and I've been having some internet stability issues, but I think this computer should be okay. Sounds good. So just, right. Great. So thanks to the organizers for inviting me to give a talk to you today about the role of STAT3 in ovarian cancer that my lab has been working on for the last few years. So we're interested in ovarian cancer because of the fact that it's an unmet area of need and it ranks as the fifth death, um, cancer death in women. And it's often diagnosed at late stages. And this leads to, while women respond initially to therapy, about 70% of them will relapse and leading to a low survival, five-year survival rate. And so because most ovarian cancers are um, diagnosed at advanced stage, my lab is interested in modeling this advanced stage in ovarian cancer. So in advanced ovarian cancer, cells have come off from the primary ovarian tumor, and they form these clusters of cells that are found in the CITES fluid. And so this is the fluid that's in the body cavity that's created during ovarian cancer. And these spheroids can then attach to the body cavity or the peritoneum, and they can then invade to metastasize to other areas. And so this metastasis is a little bit different than other solid tumors. And so we're interested in understanding what signaling pathways are promoting the growth of these cells in these spheroids. And so what we did is we took cancer cell lines and grew them in 2D, which is a commonly uh, common growth type, and grown them also in 3D so we could see what signals were enriched in 3D growing cells. From these cell lines, we then um, analyzed the gene expression patterns that occurred in these cells and found that there are differences in genes in 3D growing spheroids compared to 2D. We performed gene set enrichment analysis and identified the STAT3 signaling pathway as being enriched in <clears throat> excuse me, 3D growing spheroids. So STAT3 is a transcription factor that's activated by cytokine or growth factor stimulation and activated by phosphorylation. Once it's phosphorylated, it translocates to the nucleus and then regulates genes involved in a variety of cellular processes. One particular reason we're interested in STAT3 in cancer is that it's been found to be uh, phosphorylated in 70% of ovarian cancers. And so we were interested in seeing if in fact STAT3 was enriched in 3D growing spheroids. And we do see that uh, looking, doing a Western blot of cells grown in 2D versus 3D, we do see that STAT3 has uh, increased activation in 3D growing spheroids in multiple cell lines. If we reduce the expression of many of the different components of the signaling pathway, we also see reduced growth. So this suggests that STAT3 signaling pathway is important in 3D growing spheroids. Hi, Sarah. I'm sorry to interrupt. We're having a, a little bit of um, a lag on your display, and I just wanted to kind of pose a question to the Metro Tech people, if it would help if you maybe turned off your video and just Oh, I can do that. Sure. That, whether that might help. Yeah, so we can try this and see. Uh, okay. So can you see my mesothelial clearance Yes, slide? yes, I can see okay. that perfectly good. Okay, yep. 
Thanks. Okay, I also have a video coming up shortly, and I think that may be why we're creating a little bit of lag, and hopefully okay. the okay. images Thanks. will go better after. Um, so I had also mentioned during advanced ovarian cancer, we have uh, ovarian spheroids that are promoting this uh, metastasis through this method where they interact with the body cavity layer of mesothelial cells. And when this layer, the, there's an interaction, there's a moving of these cells or a clearance of these cells so they can then invade into the underlying tissue. And we can, sorry, um, in a mesothelial clearance assay where we've stained cells and grown our cancer cells as spheroids, cells and grow these at a 2D layer and add these together and then image as they are clearing the layer. And so I have this video that may have been slowing down my um, imaging. And you can see here during this video on the left, that when the cancer cells are interacting with cells, this is clearing layer of mesothelial cells. And we can then measure the amount of clearance that occurs to understand what is happening or, or affecting the ability for cells to clear. And I have attempted to reduce the expression of STAT3 with different siRNAs and perform mesothelial clearance, and then found that the reduction of STAT3 uh, significantly reduced the mesothelial clearance, suggesting again that STAT3 is important in mesothelial clearance as well as in spheroid growth. Now this raised the question of if we are inhibiting STAT3 expression, are we affecting the spheroid growth and maybe not really affecting the clearance? So we asked the question, can we inhibit STAT3 activity in a short term and see if that affects mesothelial clearance? My lab is interested in repurposing drugs for cancer therapy. And one of the drugs that we identified is a tovalone that uh, can inhibit STAT3 activity. It's a drug used commonly for pneumocystis pneumonia. And uh, we have seen that if you treat cells with a tofoclone, then you reduce the phosphorylation and activation of STAT3. Treat these cells long-term seven days and growing uh, them as spheroids. What we do see is that there is a reduction in cell size in one cell line and an increase in apoptosis, which you can see with the uh, red stain. However, we don't see this in short term. So we treated these cells. In clearance, suggesting that inhibiting STAT3 even for a short term can affect uh, or reduce mesothelial clearance. And so as STAT3 is a transcription factor, we wanted to uh, see what kind of genes may be involved in mesothelial clearance. So we knocked down a number of, uh, so we knocked down STAT3 and then um, analyzed the expression of these genes in 3D growing spheroids and compared that to ChIP-seq data looking at STAT3 binding. We identified many genes of which I'm only gonna talk about a few today um, one of the genes that we've identified as having a binding site for STAT3 and uh, is reduced with siRNA to STAT3 is TALIN1, which is a gene that's already been shown to be involved in mesothelial clearance, suggesting that STAT3 may be regulating mesothelial clearance in part by regulating TALIN1. Another gene that we've identified is SLUG as a STAT3 target gene. And uh, it's involved in EMT. And so we tested this in mesothelial clearance and found that we had reduced mesothelial clearance when we knocked down slug expression, suggesting perhaps that three is regulating many genes to promote mesothelial clearance. So we next asked the question, 
changing during mesothelial clearance to get an idea of what genes may be upregulated during clearance to promote clearance. So we developed a method to isolate the ovarian cancer cells from the mesothelial cells during mesothelial clearance using a two-step process of magnetic sorting, looking at CD24 and FM, which are found on the ovarian cancer cells, but not on the mesothelial cells. We then isolated our ovarian cancer cells and looked at STAT3 target genes, uh, their expression in our spheroids versus our spheroids which are undergoing mesothelial clearance. And I'm just showing you one time point here. But what we do see is that there's an increase in, of many STAT3 target genes when ovarian cancer cells are undergoing mesothelial clearance. Our mesothelial cells would also have an increase in STAT3 while they were undergoing uh, mesothelial clearance as well. However, we did not find genes upregulated associated with STAT3. What we did find was that our mesothelial cells had an increase in IL-6 expression, which IL-6 is one of the cytokines that leads to activation of STAT3. And importantly, we also found additional uh, genes that are associated with NF-kappa B that were upregulated in our cells while mesothelial clearance was occurring. So this suggests to us that our ovarian cancer cells may be secreting a factor to activate NF-kappa B in our mesothelial cells. So we isolated conditioned media from our 3D growing spheroids and then treated the mesothelial cells with this conditioned media and we used TNF as a positive control to activate NF-kappa B. And what we see is that all of these genes are increased with our conditioned media from ovarian cancer cells. To further the being NF-kappa B that is being activated in our mesothelial cells, we treated our cells with an NF-kappa B inhibitor, Fe117082, and then stimulated with TNF for our conditioned media. And if we inhibited NF-kappa B, we've completely inhibited the upregulation of these genes, suggesting that NF-kappa B is playing a key role in upregulating these genes in response to conditioned media from our ovarian cancer cells. So this led us to the hypothesis that NF-kappa B may be playing a key role in our mesothelial clearance. So we pre-treated our ovarian steroids with the NF-kappa B inhibitor and then performed mesothelial clearance. And we kept the inhibitor in um, when we had our interaction with our mesothelial cells. They're both being inhibited with our NF-kappa B inhibitor. And in a short six-hour time point, we see that if you have treated your cells with the NF-kappa B inhibitor, you're significantly reducing the mesothelial clearance that occurs um, in, from these cancer cells. So this has led us to a working model where our steroids have activation of STAT3. They're secreting TNF to activate NF-kappa B in the mesothelial cells. This leads to secretion of IL-6 that can then enhance the activity of STAT3 in our spheroids to help promote this mesothelial clearance. Interestingly, the IL-6 that is being produced is not actually affecting the mesothelial cells, as far as we can tell. So in conclusion, I hope that I've shown you that STAT3 is an important target in ovarian cancer, and that STAT3, uh, if we can target this, may reduce ovarian spheroid growth and mesothelial clearance. Now, I didn't have time to show much more work on repurposing drugs for ovarian cancer um, treatment. But one of my graduate students will be giving a talk, one of these lightning talks later this afternoon. I've also shown that there's this crosstalk between STAT3 and NF-kappa B that's occurring between the mesothelial cells and cancer cells to promote clearance. And so we hypothesize that targeting both STAT3 and NF-kappa B may be beneficial to uh, treat late stage ovarian cancer.
And so I'd just like to acknowledge uh, members of the Walker Lab, as well as my collaborators at UNH, and uh, mention that much of this work has been um, done based on a pilot study from the COPRI at UNH. And with that, I'll take any questions. I'm sorry about the uh, delay here with my unstable internet. All right, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, yeah, sorry about the, the poor connection. Um, I think we, we, we followed along for the most part. I think um, when we lost the audio on a couple of short occasions, so ho hopefully everyone was still able to follow. Um, so we have a question from Sonali, which, was, which is, did you evaluate the role of mesothelin in this process? I think that's something that's worth looking at. Okay. Any additional questions for Sarah? Okay. If not, I think we will proceed to our, our final talk. Thank you very much again, Sarah. Um, and I will turn it over to um, Shireen to introduce a final speaker of the session. Thank you. So our final speaker, certainly not the least speaker, is Sheldon Holder, who is an assistant professor of pathology and laboratory medicine at Brown University and is also affiliated with the Lifespan um, uh, Cancer Institute. And he's going to talk to us about PIM1 kinase, a novel target in renal cell carcinoma. Sheldon, we can't hear you. I don't know if you're muted. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I forgot to unmute. Is All that right. better? All good. All right, good. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I want to talk to you about an exciting project that's going on in my lab um, here at the Cancer Center at Brown University, um, targeting PIM1 kinase in renal cell carcinoma. Um, I do have to disclose that I have funding from Eli Lilly to um, perform a clinical trial targeting PIM1 in renal cell carcinoma, so that um, funding is a pertinent disclosure for our discussion today. Uh, renal cell carcinoma is the sixth most commonly diagnosed cancer in men in the United States and the ninth most commonly diagnosed in women. Um, but what is even more important to me is that over the last decade or so, the incidence of renal cell carcinoma has been rising. Um, back in 2016, there was an estimated almost 63,000 new cases. And this year, there's estimated to be about 76,000 new cases. Um, so you can see the incidence is rising. And with the rising incidence, although we don't know the reason for it, I think it highlights the fact that we uh, should be concentrating on having better therapies to treat patients with. <clears throat> so I'm showing you here some standard therapies that we use for renal cell carcinoma. So I am a medical oncologist and I do treat patients with renal cell carcinoma. Um, I wanna show this slide for two reasons. One, to show you that there are several FDA approved um, therapies for renal cell carcinoma. So all of these therapies are FDA approved. There are about 16, I believe on this slide. <clears throat> But the other thing I wanna highlight is that all of these therapies can really be divided into two main categories. And that's immunotherapy, which is in the yellow box on your left and vascular endothelial growth factor or VEGF targeted therapies, which are in the pink box on your right. There are some mTOR targeted therapies, um, but the mTOR pathway is very much related to the VEGF pathway so one could say it's not really a different uh, pathway, although there is a different target within the pathway. And at the bottom are the newest therapies we're using for renal cell carcinoma in the blue box. These are combination therapies. What you'll notice is that the therapy consists of one drug from the yellow box and one drug from the pink box. And so although these are new therapies where we get better response rates, longer duration of control, um, these are not new targets. These are really drugs that already exist that we've combined. And so what we usually see, although we have multiple agents we can use, none of these agents are curative. 
And patients will usually have a disease response for a period of time, and then acquired resistance will occur in the cancer and we have to switch to a different therapy. And then over time, the therapies begin to have diminishing returns, uh, mostly in my opinion, because we're still targeting the same pathways. And so what I think we really need in renal cell carcinoma, not just new medications, but medications that are targeting new targets. Um, enter PIM1 kinase, which is the kinase of interest in my lab, at least one of the kinases of interest. I'm showing you this figure um, to highlight some of the differences of PIM1 versus other kinases that we target in cancer. So many of you are probably familiar with um, the epidermal growth factor receptor, which we target in lung cancer a lot, or EGFR, um, or the BRAF, um, mutated BRAF, which we target in melanoma. So a lot of times when we're targeting kinases, we're targeting a kinase that's associated with the receptor. Um, like you can see Jack 1, 2, and 3 is up here. Um, and oftentimes the kinase is mutated and the mutation makes the kinase constitutively active. So it's no longer regulated and that drives the oncogenic process. And that kinase is often a receptor associated kinase um, or a kinase in the signal transduction pathway. But what I want to highlight is that PIM is an effector kinase. And what I mean by that is that it's not a receptor associated kinase. It's not really in the signal transduction pathway. But whenever that signal reaches the nucleus, PIM1 is one of those um, programs that is run as a result of that signal re re reaching the nucleus. And so PIM1 is transcribed as a direct result of whatever that upstream oncogenic signal is. So it's the effector kinase. And what does PIM1 do? Um, so we don't have time to talk about all of these pathways, but PIM1 phosphorylates uh, these substrates that I'm showing you here. And as a result, it affects multiple cell processes, including increasing transcription, inhibiting apoptosis, promoting cell cycle progression, and promoting translation. You can see how any self-respecting cancer cell would love to have a lot of a protein or a kinase around that affects all of these processes in a way that gives that cancer cell a survival advantage over any other cells. Um, and then the other thing that's very interesting about PIM1 is that the wild type form of PIM1 without any mutation is constitutively active. Um, so PIM1 is usually regulated at the transcription level and the degradation level. And actually, we don't usually see mutations of PIM1 when we look at um, tumors that are using PIM1, we usually see increased expression. And because the kinase is constitutively active in the wild type, increased expression, um, should, increased expression results in increased signaling through whatever pathways PIM1 is involved with. You, so you have constitutively active um, PIM1 in the wild type state. Um, in evaluating whether PIM1 is involved in renal cell carcinoma, we did some preliminary work. Um, and I'm showing you one uh, representative picture from some of that preliminary work. So this is a um, experiment where we actually stained the nephrectomy tissue. So in patients who had renal cell carcinoma and had their kidney removed, we stained that tissue um, for PIM1. And we stained the normal tissue, which I'm showing you in panel A, and we also stained the tumor itself, which I'm showing you in panel B. And what I want you to notice is that in panel A, you can see that normal kidney tissue stains for PIM1. So this is the proximal tubule, which has membrane staining, all of this brown that you see makes this circle. If the tube were coming, if the proximal tubule were, were coming at you out of the screen, um, or if it was in the same plane of the screen, you can see that there's membrane staining around the tubule. But in the tumor, you can see that the staining pattern is distinctly different. There's distinct nuclear staining of PIM1. And so this, we saw this in many samples, um, actually in most of the samples that we stained. And again, this is matched tissue. So this is the same patient's tumor and the same patient's normal tissue from the same kidney. Uh, so we really think this shows that PIM1 is doing something different in the tumor than it is in normal tissue. Uh, we extended this kind of analysis a little bit by using a tissue microarray. Um, doing the same sort of experiment, we stained the microarray with PIM1, and the microarray contained um, matched tissue from patients um, of their normal kidney tissue and their adjacent, and sorry, and the adjacent tumor. 
And the grades up the top are not grades of tumor. This is the pathologist grading of the intensity of PIM1 staining from no staining, which is grade zero, all the way to very intense staining for PIM1, which is grade four. You can see that what we would expect, normal tissue does stain for PIM1 um, at low levels. Uh, but what we see is that whenever there was intense staining of PIM1, that was for the most part associated only with tumor. There was one normal adjacent tissue that did stain um, grade three um, and none that stained for grade four. So again, we think that there's something about having a lot of PIM1 around. And remember, PIM1 in the wild type state is constitutively active. And so if there's a lot of PIM1 around, you're getting stimulation of all of these pathways that I showed you in which PIM1 is involved. And so we think that PIM1 is doing something in renal cell carcinoma. And because of that, we also decided to look at some um, analyses of whether increased expression of PIM1 um, has any effect on outcomes. <clears throat> so we're sh I'm showing you here an analysis from the TCGA database where we separated patients in the pan, sorry, in the kidney pan cancer atlas and separated patients into patients in blue that had normal expression of PIM1. This is mRNA data um, versus patients who had elevated levels of PIM1 mRNA. You can see here, this is an overall survival curve. If patients have increased expression of PIM1 mRNA, they have poorer outcomes, they have shorter overall survivals than patients who have normal levels of PIM1 mRNA. Now, I, I don't think that this necessarily means that PIM1 expression gives um, results in a worse kind of renal cell carcinoma. That's certainly possible. But the other um, conclusion could be that um, the drugs that we use to treat renal cell carcinoma nowadays don't target PIM1. And so if patients have renal cell carcinoma in which PIM1 is an integral component, um, they may not have as good control of their disease because we're not using any agents that are targeting PIM1. Um, so that's the other way to think about this da these data. Um, so I'm gonna skip over a lot of the benchmark research that we did um, targeting PIM1 in renal cell carcinoma, but we have a lot of cell line data that shows that if you target PIM1, um, you can have uh, effects on renal cell carcinoma cell lines to increase apoptosis and decrease proliferation. I'm showing you here one of our mouse studies in which we target PIM1 in renal cell carcinoma. Now, I should highlight that the drug we are using to target PIM1 is a bemaciclib, which some of you may know is actually a CDK4-6 inhibitor that's FDA approved for breast cancer. But what many people don't know is that abemaciclib is also a potent PIM1 inhibitor. Um, there are currently no FDA approved PIM1 inhibitors being used clinically, although there are lots of PIM1 inhibitors being used in the lab. Um, but we wanted to use something that can be used clinically um, so, that we can, um, so that we can do some clinical trials. And so we're using abemaciclib. And what you can see here, every line represents a mouse. If you treat mice in black with vehicle, the tumors grow over time. This is about a seven week experiment. If you treat mice in yellow with sunitinib, which is standard therapy, it's a VEGF directed um, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, um, you get a varying responses. You get some mice that have shrinkage of tumor over time. Most mice have stabilization of their tumor, neither growing nor shrinking, but kind of just staying the same. We call that stable disease. And then there are some mice who initially have stable disease, and then they develop resistance over time. And so that by the end of the experiment, their tumors are growing, although previously their tumors were stable. This actually reflects very well what happens in real life when we treat patients with sunitinib. Um, some will have extended control and shrinkage of their tumor. Most will have stabilization of disease and then over time will develop resistance. If you treat the mice with abemaciclib, you'll notice that there is a gradual reduction in tumor size for the entire course of the experiment. And if you combine abemaciclib with the sunitinib, you'll notice that in most of the mice, there's a very rapid reduction in tumor size. Many of the mice had um, a 50% um, reduction in tumor size or more after only three days of treatment. And then after that initial rapid reduction in tumor size, there's a continued slower reduction in tumor size over time. Um, we 
after this, we took the mice, these mice that are represented in yellow that were on sunitinib alone. Um, after seven weeks on sunitinib monotherapy, we added abemacyclic. So now these are mice who have had sunitinib for seven weeks, and now we're going to give them combined therapy. Remember, in this cohort of mice, some mice have tumor shrinkage, some mice have stabilization, and there are some mice that are having resistance with growth of tumor over time, even though they're on the sunitinib. And what we see is that when you add a bamaciclib to those mice, again, you get a rapid reduction in tumor size with continued slower reduction in tumor size over time, even in the mice that appear to have resistance to sunitinib. We thought that was a very interesting finding. And so based on these data and other data that I didn't have time to show you, um, we opened a clinical trial um, to target renal, PIM1 and renal cell carcinoma, where patients are receiving sunitinib sorry, sunitinib and abemaciclib. Um, these are patients who have metastatic disease, who have already had immunotherapy and a targeted kinase inhibitor. Um, so for many patients, this is second or third line therapy. This is a phase one study because these drugs have not been combined in humans before, although separately they are FDA approved, um, but not in combination. And so as a phase one study, we're mainly evaluating safety and tolerability. Um, but the plan is once we prove that it, that it is a safe and tolerable drug combination, we do plan to move on to a phase two study to formally evaluate for efficacy. Of course, we have many clinical correlates, which I don't have time to talk about right now, but um, one of those which is important to us is evaluating whether PIM1 expression is a biomarker for responses. So do patients who have increased levels of PIM1 protein or mRNA in their tumor, do those patients respond better or more likely respond to the combination therapy? Um, or is there any association at all with PIM1 expression? Of course, we are very interested in pursuing in the lab what are the upstream drivers of PIM1 expression and what are the downstream substrates of PIM1 expression in renal cell carcinoma. And we think the answers to both of those questions will elucidate for us additional targets for renal cell carcinoma and thereby broaden the therapies that we can use in the clinic to continue to improve um, survival rates and control rates for patients in the clinic. Um, there are several people that I want to acknowledge. I'm at the Cancer Center at Brown University. Um, I'm showing you here several people who were instrumental in recruiting me here from Penn State and helping me to be able to open that clinical trial here at Brown. So it was open at Penn State before I moved here. I recently moved here just a few months ago. Um, we hope to have that study open here at Lifespan uh, very, very soon. And so look out for that study. Um, and so these are several people that were involved in that process. And then at Penn State, these were people who were instrumental in having the study open there. Eli Lilly is funding this phase one study and the American Cancer Society uh, through their IRG mechanism um, funded much of the basic science work that went that uh, preceded the clinical trial that we just discussed. And with that, I will take some time for questions. All right, excellent. Thank you very much, Sheldon. Great talk. Um, we can open it up for questions. Um, let me just check the chat box, the chat box, I'm not seeing any questions. I, I have a question about, you know, some of the studies you, you, you showed with your um, sunitinib and your abamaciclib. I hope I pronounced those right. Um, so uh, were those PIM1 positive or negative or CDK4-6 positive or negative? So how do, how do you determine whether the effects you're observing are dependent on PIM1 versus CDK4-6 or both? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so I skipped over some of that information uh, for time, but uh, I, I believe you're talking about these data that I've shown here in yes. the mouse study. Um, so these actually were um, xenograft tumors in the mice. So we used a cell line called 7860. This is a cell line that has increased expression of PIM1. Um, so we know from the um, from that evaluation in the lab uh, that and other people have shown that PIM1 is increasing that cell line. We didn't formally evaluate um, CDK4-6 
But what we are currently doing in the lab is trying to get at that question. Uh, because abemaciclib is an inhibitor of CDK4-6 and PIM1, how much of this effect is due to its CDK4-6 activity? How much of this effect is due to its PIM1 activity? I can tell you that some other um, CDK4-6 inhibitors that don't have PIM1 activity, we don't see the same kind of um, effect in cell lines okay. that we do for bemaciclib. Um, but we're also um, in the process of doing some more nucleic acid um, so things like knocking down PIM1 versus CDK and seeing if we can tease out um, whether the effect is all PIM1 or CDK or actually a combination of both. Um, there, is, there is some data from other labs that targeting CDK4-6 um, can also be efficacious um, in renal cell carcinoma. So there might be uh, some benefit of both hitting CDK4-6 and PIM1. Um, okay. in renal cell carcinoma. And, and, and so for this clinical trial, that it, it seems like this is ongoing. Um, yes. So, so what are your selection criteria for patients for this trial? And are, are you assessing PIM1 mutational status and, and, and other things prior to enrollment in this trial? Um, so to be eligible for the study, it's a phase one study. So really to be eligible, you only have to have had prior immunotherapy, which is standard of care, and prior um, VEGF targeted um, therapy, so something like sunitinib or one of the other new drugs that are currently available, like cabozentinib. So, if patients have had immunotherapy and a targeted therapy and the tumor has progressed through both of those, yeah. then patients are eligible for this study. Okay. Um, we are not, patients do not have to have, have proven increased PIM1 expression in order to be eligible, but we are evaluating tissue okay. and, and other, um, you know body fluids um, for PIM1 and some other potential biomarkers. Okay, okay, interesting. All right, um, do we have any additional questions for Sheldon? Okay, I, I, I don't see any coming. Um, what I'd like to do now is, because we, we have a little bit of time, well, actually we've got, just got five minutes, is invite all of the um, speakers to come back on um, if they wanna um, put on the videos and uh, just open it up for discussion. Um, everyone's available. If, if anyone has any questions for any of the speakers, any comments for any of the speakers, that would be, that would be um, good. Um, one of the things um, I was kind of intrigued by, uh, you know, so we had two talks that focused on maybe AML and in particular pediatric AML. And, and one of the things that's very interesting about that is that you know, the mutational burden of pediatric AML seems to be quite low. And that seems to be a barrier to effective treatment, right? Which is in, in some ways counterintuitive, but, but it is what it is. Um, it, is there any way to overcome that? Is there any way to deliberately make a tumor more, to create a higher mutational burden in a tumor to make it more um, amenable to maybe, let's say, a, a treatment like immunotherapy? Is that something that could even be considered? I don't know if anyone wants to comment on that. I'm not sure if Sonali is back on or not. Um, so I think one of the things we're finding is that the, the somatic mutation burden is low in DNA, um, but I don't think we fully appreciate the somatic landscape in RNA. Um, and RNA has traditionally been very challenging to use to find genomic lesions. Um, so I do think there's a lot of potential with these structural variants and neoepitopes analysis that we're conducting on these structural variants and so forth to potentially um, improve treatment strategies for, um, for kids with um, um, AML. Um, and Sonali's work has also focused on overexpression of molecules and again, things like that where we do think the signature is going to be um, very valuable. The RNA signature is probably going to be much more valuable than the DNA signature for designing therapies and, and targeted treatments. Okay, very good. Um, I had a question for Adam that I kind of held back just because of time constraints. Um, so Adam, you, you mentioned the prophylaxis treatment with methotrexate. Um, and you know, I was I was just curious about that. Is 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 there a uh, a rational kind of mechanistic reason as to why they do that? And it, it seems like it's 
not particularly effective. And, and I don't know if you maybe want to comment on the, the rationale for that approach. Yeah, I think um, there, there is a good rationale for it. It's, it's, it's very, very high doses, it's lethal doses. Methotrexate penetrates into the CNS and can okay. actually cure the CNS lymphoma uh, when you give like doses of 100 times over what normally would be tolerable by a human. Um, the, the, there is a, there's just never, it has never been studied prospectively for the purpose of prophylaxis. So it's actually quite effective when combined with treatment for CNS lymphoma or for Burkitt's lymphoma. Uh, but the studies that use it for prophylaxis are very mixed. There, there's really uh, at least 10 different studies in the past uh, five or 10 years, and some show benefit, others show zero benefit, and they're all retrospective. And um, I think in the past two years, most studies should know benefit. And this morning I looked at one and, and there is a benefit. Mm -hmm. So really, unless there's a prospective study, we can't say it retros retrospectively. Um, it, is, it is particularly effective um, against this um, MCD lymphoma, which some, you know, it's, a, it's an anti-metabolite and some aggressive lymphoma just don't care about it really. And the metatrophic has no activity against them. So it, it probably is effective for this subgroup of primary sinus lymphomas that are uh, dependent on um, or sensitive to antifolate anti metabolites. Okay. But others don't. It's a problem. It probably has to be combined with other agents really to achieve true cure and, and, and good prophylaxis. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, anyone, any additional comments or questions in the remaining one or two minutes? I wanted to make a comment about the AML, even though maybe I'm just doing it very carefully, but there's a price to pay for more mutations, which is the tumors are more disorganized. So actually low mutation tumors are maybe more amenable to target its driver inhibition, like with IDH1 uh, or APML, and then you don't really need a high uh, mutation burden. For immunotherapy, it's, it's probably better to be disorganized and have a lot of new mm -hmm. antigens. Um, but a lot of pediatric AMLs or, or young adult AMLs with uh, core binding factor uh, mutations, they're just highly curable at this point, and it's gonna be hard to improve on any treatment. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, we're at um, 11.30, so we're at the end of the allocated time. Um, I wanna say, Cynthia, thanks to all of the speakers. Um, really enjoyed all of the talks. Um, Shireen, thank you very much for co-chairing this, this um, session. Uh, and thanks to all of the the audience for um, tuning in and, 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 and listening along. So um, I wish you guys all the best. Uh, enjoy the rest of the meeting and thank you very much.